So uh, I will call the uh, Hingham, the February 22nd, 2021 meeting of the Hingham School Committee to order at 7.03 p.m. Uh, this meeting is being held remotely as an alternate means of public access pursuant to an order issued by the governor of Massachusetts dated March 12th, 2020, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. We are hereby advised that this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the town of Hingham in accordance with the open meeting law. If any participant wishes to record this meeting, please notify me at the start of the meeting in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 20F, so that I may inform all the other participants of said recording. I know Harbor Media is recording tonight. If anyone else is planning to record this meeting, could you raise your hand? I see Sean Galvin has his hand up. Julie, could you? Hi, Sean, are you recording? Nope, it's just for a public comment that I want to um, address. I just want to, when okay. we get the public comment, I will speak. Okay, great. Thanks, Sean. Okay, um, before we get started tonight, you might have noticed we have a different um, format. We're using the Zoom webinar. Um, one of the side effects from all of <laughs> everything that's happened in the past couple of years is we've been watching other school committee meetings and talking to other school committee members. And this format, we think, will give us a, a way to run an efficient meeting that gives us the security settings we need, but also allow the public to participate. So we'll be doing that. And because I know the budget is a hot topic right now, um, Zoom kindly gave us a free trial. So we'll have to decide by October if we're going to continue with this format or not. Um, so with all of that being said, um, we have a bunch of minutes to approve. So the first one, I'll take a motion for the to approve the minutes of the school committee meeting held on January 28th, 2021, which is a budget workshop. So moved. So moved. Thank you. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none. Um, do we, uh, do we had a, a Michelle moved, Carlos was a second and we'll go roll call, Michelle. Aye. Jen? Aye. Ness? Aye. Carlos? Aye. Libby? Libby? Oh, aye. Sorry, I, I, I'm muted and unmuted. Yeah. And Liza? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Thank you. Next, I'll take a, minute, a motion to approve the minutes of the school committee meeting held on February 3rd, 2021, which is a coffee with the superintendent. I'll make a motion. Okay, do we have a second? Second. second. Okay, thanks, Jen. Uh, any discussion? Okay, we'll go alphabetically. Michelle Ayer? Aye. Jen Benham? Aye. Ness Carenti? Aye. Carlos De Silva? Aye. Libby Lukey? Aye. Liza O'Reilly? Aye. And I'm an I as well. Yes, I'll take a motion to approve the minutes of the school committee meeting held on February 4th, 2021, which is a coffee with the superintendent. I'll make a motion to, <laughs> to approve them. Don't mean to be the motion to hog, but. <laughs> second. I'll second. Thank you. And any discussion? Okay, it makes the minutes easier if the same people do the motioning. Okay. Uh, all right, so Michelle Ayer? Aye. Jen Benham? Aye. Ness Carenti? Aye. Carlos De Silva? Aye. Libby Lewicki? Aye. Liza O'Reilly? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Okay, next is I'll take a motion to approve the minutes of the school committee meeting held on February 8th, 2021, which was a regular school committee meeting. So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? Okay, seeing none, uh, Michelle Ayer? Aye. Jen Benham? Aye. Ness Carenti? Aye. Carlos De Silva? Aye. Libby Lewicki? Aye. Michael O'Reilly? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Um, next, I'll take a motion to approve the minutes of the school committee meeting held on February 9th, 2021, which was a joint meeting with the Board of Selectmen. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none. Michelle Ayer? Aye. Jen Benham? Aye. Ness Carenti? Aye. Carlos De Silva? Carlos? Aye. 
Libby Lewicki? Aye. Liza O'Reilly? Aye. I'm an aye as well. Finally, I'll take a motion to approve the minutes of the school committee meeting held on February 10th, 2021, which was a joint meeting with ACES. So moved. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Okay, Michelle Ayer. Aye. Jen Benham. Aye. Ness Carenti. Aye. Carlos De Silva. Aye. Libby Lewicki. Aye. Isa O'Reilly. Aye. And I'm an I as well. Okay, number three is questions and comments. The Hingham School Committee encourages community engagement and welcomes questions and comments as the agenda items are discussed in the meeting. In addition, we have set aside up to 15 minutes at the beginning of this meeting for comments or questions that fall under the purview of the school committee and are not already on tonight's agenda. If any guests wish to speak, please raise your hand, state your name and address, and address your comments to the chairperson. Comments will be limited to three minutes per speaker, speaker and must relate to topics within the scope of responsibility of the school committee. As established by the Massachusetts General Laws, the responsibilities of the school committee are to, one, to select and evaluate the superintendent, two, review and approve budgets for public education in the district, and three, establish educational goals and policies for the schools in the district. Speakers are encouraged to present their remarks in a respectful manner and to consider the privacy interests of others. The public comment period is not a time for debate or response to comments by the school committee. The school committee is not adopting or endorsing any of the comments made during the public comment period. Um, so part of what that means is you may not get a response if you make a comment tonight um, because we can't comment on anything that is not on the agenda. Um, but we will listen and, um, and possibly put it put something on the agenda for future meetings. Um, also, we're going to only we're going to limit this to things that are not on the agenda already. So if you wanted to speak to anything that's on the agenda, I'd just ask you to hold your comment till that time. Um, so with the Zoom webinar uh, format, I see a number of hands up. Um, Julie O'Halloran will um, un will ask you to unmute yourself, and we'll start with Sean Galvin. Thank you. Um, I'm Sean Galvin here. Um, I want to um, thank you for doing these um, office hours on Tuesday evenings. It's allowed me and the whole community to engage and um, I am um, pleased to um, hear the progress is being made um, on the, uh, bringing the elementary students, increasing their in-person learning from uh, alternating two to three days a week to a uh, full-time um, in-person learning starting in mid-March, assuming this gets approved tonight, as well as rotating the uh, middle schools learners on the uh, Three day a week via alternating cohorts in mid March. Um, I would like to see the high school students um, start to um, get on a um, rotating three day a week um, format and eventually to by the end of March be put to full day learning and uh, full time five day a week learning in the same thing for the middle school a few weeks after they start their alternating learning. And then um, second and um, foremost, um, I understand that there are tentative dates out for there for end of the year activities such as junior prom scheduled for May 14th tentatively, the uh, seniors last day tentatively May 26th along with the senior athletic awards and the um, June the 1st the tentative date for the senior awards night and uh, June 3rd tentative date for senior prom as well as graduation tentatively and most likely to be June 5th along with the uh, tentative senior night June the 5th um, Regarding those end of the year events, um, what will be the determining factors as to whether they take place on time or have to be rescheduled or canceled or replaced with alternatives? Okay, thank you, Sean. Um, Dr. Austin will be addressing the reopening um, plan and, and, and any potential uh, move forward later in the agenda. Uh, next, Lauren Broom. Hello, can you guys hear me? 
Yeah. Okay. So I just, just a comment on tonight's, um, the sorry, sorry, Lauren, oh. did you just, just state yeah, your address? Lauren Byrne, Five Pine Grove Road. I have two kids at South School. Um, I think you all know me. I've been pretty involved since day one in this process. And I just find it really disappointing that we've been at these meetings, school committee meetings, parents showing up for months and months and months. And all of a sudden you guys decide to use this new forum this webinar, we've been talking about transparency, being collaborative. The fact that we're staring here and we can't even see all of you is awful. Um, we don't know how many people are on the line and I think that you owe it to all these residents that have showed up to let us know how many people are here. And I would really advise you again, because transparency has been an issue. We're left in the dark. The fact that you guys showed up to this meeting tonight to let us know, and, and I mean, we've been, this is probably the biggest meeting in the last year, and we can't even see your faces, is really, really, really disappointing. Your elected officials, if this wasn't COVID and we're able to be in person, we would all be looking at one another. And I think it is really disappointing and awful that you have chosen without telling anyone. I mean, right now I'm talking and I'm looking at a black screen with my name on it. It's really disappointing and quite awful. So could you let us know how many parents and residents are on this call tonight? Okay, thank, for you, thank you for your feedback, Lauren. Um, you should, so Julie, I know we, Harbor Media had requested that we change the view to single view uh, speaker. I think we might wanna go back to the panel so we can see everyone. Um, I think it's important that everyone um, is able to see the, the, everyone on the call, um, and we'll work with Harbor Media on the um, on that. Okay, so next we have uh, Rebecca Nidisco. Hi, Rebecca Nidisco, Five Lily Pond Lane. Um, my question was similar. You just changed it so that we can see all the members of the school committee on the call, but we cannot see everybody on the call, and we do not know how many residents are here at the meeting. I'd like to request. Um, how many people are attending this meeting in total, please? Uh, right now, I see 433. Thank you. Thank you. Eileen Evans? Sorry, it's Eileen. I, I see it looks like Jul. Okay, I'm not sure who's talking. Eileen Evans, could you unmute yourself? Okay. okay, wait, I did it. Are you there still? Yes. yes. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, some trouble. Um, so I see that um, the agenda item for tonight is to have um, a an update kind of on, you know, where kids are this year versus last year. Um, for my question that I had last time around, it, it sounded as though you had that data for K through six, but you didn't have it through seven through 12. Will seven through 12 be covered in this presentation? Um, we will we'll, we'll get to that um, later in the agenda. Okay. Um, I think it, it's, it's gonna be very similar to the presentation that we heard at our last meeting. Okay, so next we have Julie, if you could state your name. Hi, uh, did you mean Julie Donovan? I, it just says Julie. Yep, I think it, uh, it's you. <laughs> so. You was completely throwing me off, and I do 12 hours of Zoom calls a day, so I apologize. Um, I'm not sure if this is on the agenda, so let me just ask my question. I'm following up on Sean's ask to understand um, what the progress is to getting the middle school and high school kids back full time, just like our neighboring. Uh, school systems around here so that we're not leaving our older students behind. Right now, they feel very demoralized. They feel like they're giving up. And I think it's, an, it's, it's a fair ask for this very talented school committee and our very talented leaders to make a goal to bring the older children back full time all day right after April break. I mean, sooner would be better, but if we need to set a goal Let's bring them back that Monday after break, April break. Give them hope. We can do this. We are a talented bunch who, who can put focus behind this goal, and, and they deserve it. 
in particular the juniors and, and seniors. They deserve prom. They need to do, be deserve to be back with their peers in school. And I would really like to understand what has to happen to get the older students back full day, full time, five days a week. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Julie. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands. Let me just make sure. Yeah, I don't see any other hands for public comment. So we will move on. We're gonna take our student representative, Carly Kennedy out of order because the superintendent update will be lengthy tonight. So we want her to be able to leave if she needs to. So Carly, you can take it away. Hi everyone, thank you so much. Um, so an update on the high school events recently, um, all winter sports teams, have um, finished their seasons and had remarkable ones. Um, honorable mentions to the boys hockey team as they just became Patriot League champs with their defeat against Marshfield. Um, and then both girls hockey and boys basketball lost in the semifinals of their divisions. Um, our football fields were recently cleared the other day due to the help of many volunteers. So that football season will be underway within the next couple of days. Um, our high school was also awarded the Holmes Award for the second consecutive year. Um, and that's granted to schools who have the highest overall win percentage in their divisions of all varsity programs. So this is a reflection of our outstanding coaches, our athletic director, um, the athletes and their parents and everyone else who's helped contribute to the success of our athletic program. Um, the Hingham Historical Society has been collaborating with students at the high school and has been lending high, um, artifacts to put in the history hall display cases. So students have been decorating those cases um, as pop-up exhibits for the whole school to appreciate. Um, and then instead of our annual Boston conference, this year our Model UN Club recently participated in a Zoom conference um, over the course of four days where they communicated with students from all different countries around the world. Um, and with this, they discussed the world's rising issues and brainstormed solutions to such problems. Um, and then lastly, um, the past two weeks, our student council has been participating in our annual polar plunge at Nantasket Beach. So for two consecutive Saturdays, a group gathered and um, that consisted of towel holders and plungers who raised over $4,000 for um, the Special Olympics um, while also plunging into freezing cold water. Um, and then our council also had the greatest number of participants um, out of all councils in our region. So that's huge. Thank you. It's great. Congratulations. And I like that there was a towel holder option. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> so, thank you so much, Carly. Um, feel free to stay on, but you don't have to. <laughs> so, um, next is number four, superintendent's report. And I think we're going to start with a COVID-19 and CDC guidance update. Dr. Austin. We are. Thank you. And good evening, everyone. Uh, actually, before I start, I'd like to introduce two new people um, that are very important to the uh, central office, as all of our central office folks are. Uh, first, the uh, administrative, uh, the executive administrative assistant to the assistant superintendent uh, is Katie Volgiani. And I don't know, Katie, you're on the line. If you could just say hi real quick. Hey, everybody. Nice to meet you all. And then um, thank you, Katie. Welcome aboard. We're glad to have you here. And uh, my new administrative assistant is um, Ms. Robertson, Sherry Robertson. And Sherry, can you please uh, say hello to everyone for us? Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all. You guys should show yourself if you can, <laughs> just so they know who you are. <laughs> there we I go. get it. There you go. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> all right. All right. So thank you, welcome aboard to all of them. I know that uh, we look forward to having you uh, be part of these meetings, so thank you. Uh, tonight, folks, um, we do have, I, I think there are four different PowerPoint presentations, so uh, we're gonna run through them. I'll run through the CDC uh, guidance and COVID-19 rather quickly tonight, uh, and uh, leave time. I know that uh, Dr. Lubilwa will go next to hear the performance data. So we'll bring this up quickly uh, and ask uh, Julie to please the slideshow. So just this week, um, we continue to see the, the slide and number of cases in Hingham. Uh, as you can see at the top of your screen, the cases per 100,000 now have gone from a high of 70.8 uh, in the middle of January to now a month later down uh, almost uh, more than half uh, to 31.5. Um, so we're in very good shape. And then our test positive rate is now below three at 2.89%. 
our cases in the, the schools have also uh, flattened out. As we had said, this is uh, very good news. Uh, we've had now a total of 197 cases. Last week, we had six cases total between staff and students. We had three students uh, and three staff uh, that tested positive. Uh, and then that's reflected, as you can see in the uh, bottom bar graph, that once again, uh, we are down to um, November uh, rates. Uh, basically, uh, so that's very good news. We continue to, to drop uh, the cases in, in town. Uh, the quarantine, uh, as you can see, that little number over there, the 214 to 220 is very, very small. I will say that last week was a uh, week of vacation, so uh, the quarantine numbers were probably a little bit off, uh, and we did not count them. So uh, there is a, probably a delay in reporting some of the, the 214 to 220 data due to the February vacation, so that may need to be updated a little bit later. And good news continues with we've tested now over 909 tests with staff uh, and still only have one positive for a 0.11% positive rate. Uh, once again, um, some very good news uh, for the school system and uh, for our teaching uh, and education staff. I want to go a little bit over, uh, many people saw that the CDC came out with new guidance. Um, and so I want to, to go over a little bit of this. Um, so what did the CDC say about COVID-19 in children? And that while fewer children than adults have COVID-19, uh, the number of school-aged children with COVID-19 has been increasing. Uh, children and adolescents can be infected with a virus that causes COVID-19, can get sick with COVID-19, and can spread the virus to others. Uh, most children and adolescents with a virus that causes COVID-19 have mild symptoms and some have no symptoms at all. Because children with a virus that causes COVID-19 can spread it to other children and adults, it's important to take measures to minimize the risk of spread in school settings. In-person learning for elementary schools is likely to have less risk of in-school transmission than middle school and high schools, and in-person instruction should be prioritized over extracurricular activities to minimize the risk of, of transmission. So on the recommendations on deciding to how to open, and it's important to us, we've already been open, but it's really about how to move forward and I think they apply. Uh, it's a critical for schools to open as safely and as soon as possible and remain open to achieve the benefits of in-person learning and key uh, support services. It enables schools to open and remain open. It's important to adopt uh, and consistently implement the actions to slow the spread of COVID-19, both in schools and in the community. Uh, if the community transmission is high, students and staff are more likely to come to school while infectious and COVID-19 can spread more easily in schools. So it's very good news that our numbers continue to drop in the community. K-12 schools should be the last settings to close. After all, our other mitigation measures in the community have been employed and the first to reopen when they can do so safely. I do want to take a note that we have been opened and we've remained open since the uh, middle of September uh, when we opened for in-person learning. We did have um, a um, small closure at Plymouth River for four days uh, and then a couple of days at um, the middle school. But other than that, we've been able to stay open as a district for the entire time. So we certainly live by that theory of staying open. Given the likely association between levels of community transmission, COVID-19, and the risk of exposure in schools, the first step in determining when and how to reopen safely involves assessing the level of community transmission. School administrators working with local public health, uh, public health officials should assess the level of risk in the community and the likelihood of, case, uh, of a case in a school facility, the likelihood that a case would lead to an outbreak, and the consequences of in-school transmission. The good news is we are doing all of those things in Hingham Public Schools. Finally, this is a new chart that's de uh, developed by the uh, the CDC. This has not been developed, uh, uh, I want to say, approved or um, adopted into uh, Massachusetts yet. Um, but this is the recommended implementation of mitigation strategies uh, in K-12 learning models by level of community transmission. Um, Right now, if you look from the left, low transmission to moderate to substantial and to high, um, we are currently in the moderate transit, transition, transmission, excuse me, um, which means that we should be considering the K-12 schools fully on person, but that physical distancing of six feet or more to the greatest extent possible. Again, that, there's also mitigation strategies uh, that we will employ to, to hopefully increase that so we can move to uh, fewer uh, um, feet between students. Um, you can go ahead and move on to the next. I'm going to also have this, I, I will make sure that everybody has this uh, access to this. It'll be posted online. Um, you want to back up for a minute, Julie? 
So just a footnote that the levels of community transmission, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post this online, and it talks about what's in a moderate, what's in a high, what's in a low. Um, so you'll see the, the cases per um, 100,000 of 10 to 49 are considered to be in the moderate range, which is exactly where we are. Um, again, we, we, we want to uh, consider the diagnostic testing for uh, COVID, uh, is, which is intended to identify the occurrence of uh, infection at the individual level as form and there's reason to suspect. Um, we are doing some of that already, um, obviously with our testing in schools. Uh, if physical distancing of at least six feet among all students, teachers and staff uh, within a class cohort is not possible at all times, we need to ensure physical distancing between the classes themselves, cohorts and or pods. Um, hybrid learning or reduced attendance is intended to maximize physical distance between students. Uh, schools may consider hybrid learning models or instructional modes when a substantial percentage of students are in a virtual only instruction. That's not our case, we're in a hybrid, so now we'll be considering uh, in person, more live in person. Uh, we have to have strict implementation and mitigation strategies, which we do, and then have including policies that require consistent, corrected use of masks, physical distance, and at least six feet, and all other key mitigation strategies, all of which we are following, and that school officials should implement limit limits on spectators and attendees for sports, extracurricular activities, and school events, which is already what we're doing. So how do we open schools safely? Evidence suggests that many K-12 schools that have strictly implemented the mitigation strategies have been able to safely open for in-person instruction and remain open. The CDC provides an operational strategy to support K-12 schools in opening for in-person instruction and remaining open through an integrated package of mitigation, um, mitigation components. These essential uh, elements include consistent implementation of layered mitigation strategies to reduce transmission, Indicators of community transmission reflect level of community risk, phase mitigation and learning modes based on levels of community transmission, and that the following uh, public health efforts provide additional layers, uh, which is testing to identify individuals with COVID-19, which you're doing, and then vaccination for teachers and school staff and communities as soon as supply allows. And we do hope that vaccine is gonna be made available to teachers within the next few weeks and uh, hopefully soon. So finally, the CDC recommends mitigation strategies. Um, that's the universal and correct use of masks, social distancing, hand washing, maintaining clean facilities, and contact tracing. We are doing all those things. Uh, and then the following public health efforts provide additional layers of COVID-19, um, which is testing to identify individuals COVID-19 infection to limit transmission outbreaks. We are voluntary staff uh, staffing, um, sorry, voluntarily uh, testing staff with COVID um, right now, and that we will plan uh, for later on this week to begin our pool testing of students in a pilot. So we're going to be doing a uh, a um, smaller phased in uh, pilot testing with our, our students and we will phase in to full implementation over the next few weeks. And then finally, the vaccination for teachers, which we have no control over, but hopefully that comes soon. So it's good news for us that we have all of the major components of the strategies that they recommend, as well as the additional layers of the testing. Uh, and then finally, once we get the, te the teachers vaccinated uh, and the, all the education staff vaccinated, uh, we'll, we'll finalize all of the layers of mitigation strategies. I said, I'm gonna have this online for all of you. Um, so you can read that. I know I did that very quickly so we can get to other things tonight, um, but some great information and wanted to share what the CDC came up with as well. Great, thank you, that's helpful. Um, does anyone on the committee have any questions or comments about the CDC guidance? Um, I think, uh, Liza? Yeah, real quick. Um, I think, you know, if we can get the pool testing for the students going, that's great. And um, can we also send a reminder out to parents that they can still sign up for that? Because the, the more participation we get with that, the better off we'll be for everyone on our mitigation strategies. Um, sometimes those initial emails get lost in the shuffle and we can get a reminder out, that would be great. 
Yeah, I think that's a fine idea. Right now, just to give you everybody an idea, we have over 900 um, signed up. I think it's like 950, uh, give or take. Um, and so we are making some progress with that. Um, and we will start, I, we, we are going to try to start this week on Thursday, uh, piloting two schools in fifth grade, I think is what we're going to start with, uh, just so we can work out the logistics. Uh, like we were pulled with the testing of the teachers, we actually um, had thought we needed more time to phase in, but once we did it once or twice, it was um, we were ready to go. And so we're hoping uh, once we do that with the pool testing, we'll get down a system and be able to implement faster, but can certainly send out reminders to have, um, and we will continue to do so to encourage parents to participate, uh, particularly as we talk about moving more full in. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, if any members of the public have any questions on the CDC guidance or, um, let's see, I think I see one hand. Yes, yeah, so if you could just raise your hand and um, Julie will ask you to unmute yourself. Uh, is Ken Brown is first. Oh, he disappeared. Uh, Elizabeth Moulds. Hi, Elizabeth Moulds at 70 Winter Street. Um, I think this is the right place to ask this question pertaining to the survey that just went out um, asking if we would be interested in sending our children back. At, it, the survey itself did not mention if you meant at three feet or at six feet. And I'm wondering if you could clarify that survey or resend it with clarification so people know what they're actually answering. Thank you. Thank you, and I can clarify today, I know we've got a number of 444 of attendees on, plus the, the people on the panelists. Um, we've been talking about when, if we were to bring in full in, we would have to be at three feet uh, distancing in many of our classrooms, um, but uh, we can certainly clarify, so thank you. Thank you, uh, Ken Brown? If you could unmute yourself. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, this is Megan DeSanta, Ken's wife. Um, yeah, so I was wondering, I, I was also curious to hear about the three feet versus six feet, but I'm also wondering um, why the decision to have kids um, on mask to eat lunch in school rather than having like four or five, four hour days, um, since unmasking is obviously one of the bigger risks and that seems like we could avoid that pretty easily. Okay, thank you. Yeah, do you want me to answer that at all? Um, yeah, if you, if you have an answer. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I'll give you the best one we have. I mean, we certainly talked about that at length with the administrators, and um, we understand that um, there's some concern around that. We've also seen a lot of school districts who've been able to do lunch all year long and do it safely. And so we've also heard from parents that they wanted to maximize time. Uh, and I think you'll see tonight that we need to do the best we can to work as many as much as we can with our students. Uh, and so that we decided that that was uh, in the best interest. Thank you. Uh, Eileen Bevins. Hi, does the high school have enough space at three feet? That's something we're working on right now. Um, I'm gonna give an update on that uh, a little bit later on my proposal of how we're gonna be uh, looking at how to move more uh, children into the, or students are not necessarily children at the high school level. Uh, we can certainly talk about that when I, we talk about with our proposal. All right, thank you. Uh, Julie Ravelli. Sorry, that was my son. I don't have a question. Thank you. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Hi welcome. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, next is to hear a report regarding student performance data. I'm going to turn that over to Dr. Labilwa. He's been working hard on this with all of our administrators. So I'll turn that over to him. Hi. Good evening, everyone. I um, uh, hope you all had a restful uh, February break last week, and I am very pleased to be here with you this evening. Uh, to share the results of our study uh, that was attempting to quantify um, uh, the impact of COVID-19, both on our academic performance of our students, as well as the social and emotional functioning. So I'm going to share my screen um, and run through uh, the presentation. So just bear with me for one moment. Um, the agenda is broken up really into five parts. Uh, the first one is a presentation of an, sort of an executive summary and some key takeaway findings from the analysis. Uh, part two will actually address 
um, each of the key findings and executive summary statements in more detail, um, as well as show sort of some data tables uh, to sort of back up the assertions we make under the executive summary. Um, we'll then turn it over to Dr. Vinnis, who's here with us this evening, who will speak about um, her department's analysis of special education eligibility rates uh, prior years to this year. Um, I'll then uh, address, uh, talk a little bit about how we're planning to address the needs of all of our students as we look ahead to a full return to school. Um, and I will add a lens in um, here to sort of, to sort of uh, make it clearer how um, the areas of need are really connected to our budget requests. Uh, and then finally, we'll pause there for any questions or comments from first the committee and then from the community at large. Um, so I just want to begin by acknowledging uh, the work that was done to pull this presentation together. I specifically want to recognize the work of our elementary reading team and Cindy Barrett in particular, um, Dave Jewett in mathematics and Julie Chandler, uh, math specialist, um, uh, Heather Rodriguez, our director of Council school counseling, as well as AC Decker, um, elementary adjustment counselor, as well as the entire administrative team um, who really did pull together uh, to present this work. So I'm going to start first with the executive summary and key findings. Um, so I want to begin with there has been documented history of achievement gaps between all of our students and students with disabilities, as well as high need students. Um, and this has presented itself for years pre COVID. So again, um, coming out of the pandemic, we are anticipating these achievement gaps to potentially be exacerbated. Uh, but we do want to walk into this with eyes wide open that we do have a documented history of achievement gaps. Um, the first part of the analysis really dug deep into el basic elementary reading skills. Um, our current kindergartners are currently significantly lower than previous cohorts in all measures of reading of fluency, um, and phonemic awareness skills appear to be growing at a lower rate for this year's cohort than previous cohorts. Um, again, there's data tables later which will sort of um, explain where these assumptions are being made from. Our current first grade students um, were found to be significantly lower uh, than previous cohorts, again, in all measures of both fluency as well as retail. Um, our second grade students, sorry, I'm just moving here. Our second grade students, uh, again, are presenting with significantly lower um, reading skills uh, than previous cohorts in measures of both fluency and retail, uh, but there were no significant differences found relative to the retail quality. Uh, so what this is telling me is that the extent to which the kids underlying um, sort of memory skills for remembering what they read is it, there's no difference there, but in terms of how far they're progressing relative to that skill, there is a significant difference where they're lower this year than they have been in previous years. Um, our current grade three students are also significantly lower than previous cohorts in measures of fluency and retail. Um, oral reading fluency uh, for our third graders does appear to be growing at a lower rate than previous cohorts. Um, and again, we're, we're really seeing no significant differences in retail quality. And I do wanna specify, you'll see current grade four and five both have asterisks. Um, those asterisks are there because when we get, by the time we get to grade four, um, the students who are screened shift. So kindergarten through grade three, we pretty universally screen all students um, on DIBBLES, which is a dynamic indicators of early literacy skills, uh, which looked at these basic reading skills. But in fourth and fifth grade, we really are only looking at students who have been referred for support. Uh, so we don't screen everybody, we only screen those students who have been referred for intervention. Um, and so of the current fourth grade students who have been referred for support, uh, their screenings are suggesting significantly lower um, scores than previous cohorts. And again, those previous cohorts are also students who would have been struggling in previous years. Um, and, and they're lower in oral reading fluency and retail, uh, but no significant differences are found in retail quality. Our current grade five students, and again, those are current grade five students who have been referred for support, are evidencing significantly lower skills than previous cohorts in oral reading fluency, retail and retail quality. However, um, their, their growth from beginning of year to mid-year screenings uh, in terms of oral reading fluency actually has improved. Um, the, uh, and there's no difference at uh, the mid-year in terms of early uh, oral reading fluency for our fifth graders. In terms of elementary math, uh, we do have some data relative to uh, some fact fluency uh, uh, program that we ran last year, piloted this year, running more uh, widespread across at the elementary levels. Um, that data does suggest that 
Fact fluency in mathematics does appear to be improving over where we were last year. However, we really don't have the same data systems in place that we have in reading in mathematics. Um, the, the typical measures that we would use to determine kids who need support in math, um, we really haven't been able to use, or, or what I should say is what we're using this year is not the same as what we've been using in years past. And so the study looking at where they were versus where our kids are um, really had to focus on data that we had some kind of a pre-COVID data set and a post-COVID data set to make that comparison. Uh, and in math, we really don't have any consistent tools across the two years. And that's really because of curriculum adjustments. The other thing uh, that we've ex we talked a lot to the committee about is um, the, the really the need for math support. So part of the issue here is we do not have um, consistent math support available to all students and all grades across all buildings. Um, so there's natural variation in where schools offer math support which makes comparisons really challenging. Um, we did, however, look at um, referrals made for math support this year, but we really found no meaningful patterns, again, um, because of the uh, inability to have a consistent way to deliver math support uh, to students. Um, and there really is no, we really need that universal model and systems of support across the district in order to really um, gauge progress uh, across all the areas, but really in particular in mathematics, we don't have that same data set that you just saw in reading. Uh, we, do, we have observed a 3% increase of the number of students who require math support at, um, at the middle school. Um, and I will note that the middle school uh, math su uh, support program in grade six is completely funded through um, Title I. Um, so again, part of our budget ask is to establish a academic intervention system through grade six through eight. What we have there right now is really in mathematics for grade six, and that is again, uh, totally funded through the Title I grant. Um, at the secondary level, we did actually, we, so what, to, to the earlier comment um, during public comment, what I said at the last meeting was we don't have the same skill-based data that we have in grades, uh, you know, K through six that, at the secondary level, but we do have grades. And so where we did look at the secondary level was the assignment of grades. Um, it, it to students in the core content areas, the core academic areas. So the middle school analysis suggested an overall reduction of A's and B's um, last year versus this year. And again, we were only looking at term one and two. So we were trying to capture pre-COVID to post-COVID. Um, so again, overall reduction in the number of A's and B's assigned to students with an increase in C's, 183, D 66 and F's is 78 in the core subjects. Um, what I will note is those aren't 183 students, those are 183 C's. So again, we only looked at the assignment of grades and not, uh, the, that doesn't represent, like for example, under the C's 183 students, it's just 183 C's were given to all uh, kids at the middle school. At the high school, we see an overall reduction in the number of B's, C's and D's assigned and an increase in the number of A's and an increase in the number of Fs, again, across the core uh, content areas. In terms of elementary social emotional learning, we did, look, we did look at screening data from January of 2020 as compared with December of 2020. And overall, we are seeing um, in a, a, a reduction um, or lower levels of students identified as high risk in terms of internalizing or externalizing difficulties what I will note here is we also have evidence uh, of a significant reduction in, over, in overall student enrollment. Um, however, the percentages of the kids who are enrolled who are uh, presenting with uh, at-risk levels or high-risk levels of internalizing or internalizing problems is overall lower in December of 2020 of where it was in January of 2020. Um, a slightly different picture is painted at the secondary level. So in terms of Hingham Middle School, um, when we look at their social and emotional screenings from the 18-19 school year to the 2021 school year, we are seeing higher levels of risk in all areas that we screened for. So we're seeing higher rates of total difficulty score, emotional problems, conduct problems, hyperactivity and attention, peer problems, as well as a decrease in the application and use of pro-social skills. At the high school, uh, we have data both on grade nine, and again, we wanted to have comparative data. So we have uh, the grade nine class from 2018-19, as well as the current grade nine class. And in terms of just students enrolled at grade nine, our current grade nine uh, students are, have, are experiencing higher levels of risk in all areas screened. Uh, total difficulties, emotional problems, conduct problems, hyperactivity and attention, peer problems and pro-social skills. Now there is some variation. So we looked at both kids who are identified as being some risk 
as well as kids as high risk. And there is some variation, uh, which I'll show you later in the data tables, but overall we're seeing an increase. The other data that I think is, is compelling that we have is um, because we have, it's almost longitudinal, right? So uh, the class of 2022, the current juniors were actually screened as freshmen. And so we also looked at um, their social and emotional functioning during grade nine versus where they are now in grade 11. Uh, and so for this cohort in particular, again, it's the only point where we have actual longitudinal data that we can look at. In terms of the class of 2022, overall, we're seeing higher levels of risk in all areas screened. Uh, again, total difficulties, emotional problems, conduct problems, hyperactivity and attention, peer problems and pro-social skills. And again, we do see some variation in high versus some risk um, in these areas, which I'll explain a little bit more detail later in the presentation. In terms of special education, um, this year, thus far, we, and, and Dr. Venice will explain this more uh, later in sequence of the presentation. I'm just giving you the executive summary here. Um, so uh, in the, for the 2020-2021 school year thus far, we have evaluated 215 students. Um, 169 of them have been found eligible, which represents a 79% positive eligibility rate in special education eligibility. That represents a 68% increase over the eligibility rates from the school year 2018-19 and a 46% increase over referral rates um, from last school year 2019 to 2020. Um, so those are the major bullets of the executive summary. And now I'd like to move into um, how we actually assess this impact and give the data that then backs up those uh, executive summary assertions. I want to start with the achievement gap. So what is an achievement gap? It is a persistent disparity in the academic performance among students and subgroups. In Hingham Public Schools, we actually have three uh, major groups. We have all students, which is the combined performance of all students in a particular grade level. We also have a high needs population, which is an unduplicated count of all students in a school or a district belonging to at least one of the following subgroups. Uh, so students with disabilities, English language learners, um, uh, former English language learners, and kids who are economically disadvantaged. Um, students uh, with disabilities, again, is another subgroup, and that is an overall count of students in a school or a district with a disability as defined under IDEA who have an active IEP. And so I want to share with the committee and the community um, the pattern of achievement gap uh, from so really since I've arrived at, which it actually persisted prior to my arrival. Uh, but this is the performance of our students on spring 2016 MCAS. The light blue line at the top shows the performance of all students. The orange line shows the performance of our high needs subgroup. And the darker blue line at the bottom there uh, is representing the performance of our students with disabilities. So for the layperson, the gap between that, that lighter blue line and the orange line, that gap in performance is the achievement gap. So when we talk about achievement gaps, that's what it visibly looks like when you actually represent it visually. It's that gap in, in achievement between all students with certain subgroups. This pattern, unfortunately, does hold true um, up until 2019. So this is the pattern again for 2016. This is the pattern for 2017. This is the pattern for 2018. And this is the pattern for 2019. I now want to turn attention to elementary reading skills and explain a little bit about the analysis that allowed us to make those assumptions about significant differences in performance. Um, we administer DIBBLES, again, the Dynamic Inventory of Beginning Early Literacy Skills, I think is what it's called. Um, uh, the, the DIBBLES is an assessment of student uh, basic reading skills. And the hypothesis here was there are no significant differences between the average performance of our current students versus previous students. Now, what makes this data really powerful to me is we actually have, going back to 2011, uh, nine years of data. So I know, going back to 2011, how, for example, my kindergarten students performed on all measures of the DIBBLES. And we actually have longitudinal data from every single year, go back to 2011, of how the students performed. So those groups of kids from 2011 through last year, 2020, they formed the population group, right? So I compared this year's class against the performance of kids in the same grade going back for the last nine years. 
We looked at both screening data coming from the beginning of the year, as well as mid-year screening data. We do not have the ability to look at spring screening because last year, uh, because of the shutdown, we actually did not screen anybody in the spring uh, because of the shutdowns. We, this is about all the data I have relative to where we were pre-COVID to now. I could go back to the spring of 19, that's fair, um, but we'll sort of cross that bridge when the spring comes and sort of see what makes the most sense for analysis. <laughs> um, but partly being a researcher by training, uh, we went and, and looked at the appropriate statistic to use to test that hypothesis. And we landed on a Welsh's t-test. Um, why this t-test is meaningful is we actually did a two-tail analysis. So we didn't make the assumption that this year kids are lower. We actually uh, made the hypothesis that there are no significant differences between the average perform, the averages of, this, of the current kids versus the previous kids. Um, that allowed us to run a two-tailed analysis. The test also assumes unequal variance. So because I have a population data set of, for example, 2,600 kids versus 200 kids, um, we needed to find a statistic that accounted for that unequal variance as well as the unequal population sizes. Uh, we did set probability at 0.05%. Why um, is because we wanted to be 95% sure that the differences that we were seeing were real and not due to chance alone. So by having the, prob the alpha, the probability level there, we were able to say with certainty that these differences are not due to chance alone. Right Now, I don't know why they're different. We'll get into that a little bit later in the presentation, but the analysis was looking at is, again, testing the hypothesis, is there a significant difference between this year's kids and previous year's kids? And so again, we're looking at Dibble. So you'll see data tables that have these letters to the left side of the screen, FSF, LNF, PSF, and WF, ORF. FSF is first sound fluency. That is a measure of basic phonemic awareness skills in the beginning and middle of kindergarten. We also have LNF, which is letter naming fluency, which is really a predictive measure. It's a simple measure of how quickly and how well can the students name the alphabet, essentially. They're just naming letters. Um, PSF looks at set phoneme segmentation fluency. So this is a student's ability to segment three and four phoneme words into their individual phonemes fluency. NWF, which is nonsense word fluency, is a test of the alphabetic principle where they essentially need to read nonsense words that are not real words, but apply the phonic skills they're learning to actually pr uh, pronounce and read the nonsense words. And finally, we have ORF, which is oral reading fluency and, fluence and retail fluency. This is a measure that assesses the accuracy and the fluency of te uh, with text and this, the, the student's ability to effortlessly translate letters and sounds and sounds to words. The fluent reader is one who is decoding, uh, whose decoding processes are automatic, requiring no conscious attention. Right? They don't. Um, that's what, what. That's the definition of a fluid reader is when you don't need to think about the process of actually decoding. And so I just, I'm, I'm just explaining this because in the data tables you'll see these codes, um, and I wanted you, the committee to understand sort of what the different parts of Dibbles were and what we looked at. And so the next series of slides. Um, I won't spend a ton of time on, um, but they are the data tables. Um, and I'll take the first one in kindergarten and I'll, I'll show you what, these, uh, what this actually means. Um, and so again, on the left-hand column, you'll see those letters. FSF is first sound fluency. LNF, for example, is letter naming fluency. And you'll see the, uh, the, the one or the two next to them. The one indicates beginning of the year screenings and the two indicates the same skill at mid-year. And so if we just take the very first line, I want to explain the columns to folks in case there's any questions. Um, so what we looked at was the PN is the population, the number of kids in the population. So in, for going back to 2011, I have had 2,506 kindergartners take this measure. The next column is the population mean. So the on average, those 2,506 students on average scored a 20.76 on first sound fluency. The next column represents the standard deviation. So how much in standard terms did the actual scores vary above and below the mean? And so for first sound fluency, that number is 12.20, and that's in the population. So all the kindergartners in Hingham for the last nine years on average have scored a 20.76 with a standard deviation of 12.20. Now the next column, the SN, is the sample. 
the sample n, the, sam the number of kids in the sample. So this year I had 206 kindergarten students who were screened on first found fluency. Their mean was a 20.30. Their standard deviation was 11.33. And so that's what I'm comparing. I'm asking the question, is 20.76 significantly different, or actually what I'm saying is there's no difference between 20.76 and 20.30. And in fact, for this first line, there is no significant difference. Remember the alpha level was set to 0.05. So anything below a 0.05 is considered significant. Here we see a 0.58, it's not significant. Now the column just to the left of the probability, that's the T statistic. Um, so that is the statistic that we used, and uh, what you see is the T-score is the 0.054, and in, in parentheses you'll see 235, which are the degrees of freedom, which I will not bore everybody with. Uh, it's just, it's a, a statistical understanding, uh, really looking at the geometric understanding of math uh, as, to try to capture the actual population. So what I've done is I've actually highlighted the places where we see significant differences, okay? So that which should bring your eye uh, more, and I looked at the, the mean, so Letter naming fluency, um, the, the population mean was a 27.20, and the current um, sample mean is a 24.61. Um, that is a significant difference at the 0.01 level. So what that means is I am 99% sure that that difference is not due by chance alone. Does that make sense to the committee? I just wanna pause there, and Carrie, if that's okay with you, just to take any questions before we go any further, just because uh, if there is, I'd like to answer it now and then breeze through these and get into the other pieces. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, if any members of the committee have any questions so far, if you could just unmute yourself. Well, just one question, Jamie. Can you tell me when this is taken? Is this the kindergartners who were assessed at the beginning of the year? Can you just remind me of that? Yeah, so the FSF1 is the beginning of the year yeah. and the FSF2 is mid-year. Okay. So we can actually look at it this way. We can look at it um, um, uh, top, uh, top to bottom two nests, right? So in terms of first sound fluency, they start the year at a 20.76, but then by the mid-year, they're at 42.37. Okay, thank and you. If, and then if you look over here to the right, notice how they start the year in the same place with no differences with first sound fluency, but by the mid-year screening, it's a significant difference. Okay. okay. And that's where the earlier assertion was made that they're not growing at the same rate relative to fluency. Okay. That makes sense. Yep. Uh, so we can also look at it from from be beginning of year to mid year, but again, the analysis I was looking at was really looking at how this year's group is different than previous years. That's great. Thank you. You're welcome. So this is the kindergarten analysis. I'm sorry, Jamie. Oh, sorry. I have a question. I'm so sorry. Um, how do you derive the figure at the far right column? The, the p equals. So that's, that's the actual output, Libby. So when I ran the analysis, so if you look at the top line, when I actually ran the statistic, the probability was 0.58, which means that I could not, that the, I, I had to accept that my hypothesis was accurate. There's no difference. Anything but how that, did you get the 0.58? Where did that number come from? That comes from the statistic. Uh, that comes from the output of actually running the statistics. So it will, it tells us in the system um, what the probability is after it calculates the analysis. I didn't make it up. It actually came from this, from the statistics. What are you calculating? What statistics are you calculating? So again, we were looking at, we were calculating the difference between the means of the previous years of kindergartners with the current year of kindergartners. So when we did that analysis, it produces that T statistic of a 0.54. Now, what I should note, just as an aside, essentially the larger the T, the bigger the difference, right? So it calculates out a T at 0.54, which was not significant. Um, and that's where the 0.58 comes from. Whereas you look at a letter naming fluency, again, we're seeing a significant difference here at the 0.01 level, which means we're 99% sure that that difference is not due to chance alone. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. I just didn't wanna go further if there was questions, Chair person. Yeah, no, I appreciate it, it. thanks. Um, so, so that's the kindergarten analysis. This is what it looks like for grade one. Um, as you can look to the right here, every single test run or analysis run for grade one um, did produce a statistically significant difference at the 0 .00, actually went out about four decimal points for zero. Um, and what, why this is, um, 
uh, sort of a focus of mine in grade one is this is the cohort of kids who actually um, lost part of their kindergarten year because of the school shutdown or now are back in school. Um, and what we're seeing is in every measure of um, reading assessment or, or basic, again, basic reading skills measured through Dibbles, we are seeing a significant uh, difference um, a, a, a across the board for every measure assessed in um, first grade reading. Um, we are now looking at grade two, beginning of the year. Um, and again, that's where at the last row there in retail quality, where we made the assertion that um, while the retail is lower, the quality of what they're remembering is the same. So again, that's telling me that this is more an issue of skill than it is of sort of underlying ability, right? Like so, so that they can still remember the same quality of, of material. It's just they're not um, uh, remembering as much as previous year's cohorts are. Uh, this is the grade two mid-year analysis. Um, and I'll just pick it up here just because I don't want to spend a ton of time here. This is just the backup again for those initial assertions. Uh, this is the grade three analysis. As you can see, we're, we're not, we have significant differences in early reading fluency accuracy, retail, words read correctly for fluency mid-year, mid-year accuracy, and mid-year retail. This is grade four. And again, if you notice the population, this first column begins to drop, right? Because we're not screening everybody. We're in fourth and fifth grade, we're only screening those kids who are sent for support. Compare that against grade three, that, that column, and then this is grade four, that number drops. And it drops again in grade five. Um, but in both grade four and five, again, the kids who were referred for support are being compared against the population of kids who've been compared for support. And what this is telling me is the kids this year who are struggling are actually struggling at a, a, at a higher level um, than the previous year's kids in the same grades who have also been struggling. I then wanna turn the attention a bit to elementary mathematics. So again, earlier in the presentation, we talked a little bit about how we don't have the same systems in place for math, but we actually do have is some uh, fact fluency data um, through reflex math. So last year, the district piloted reflex math as a strategy to increase fact fluency. Um, and I will caution any analysis here because in the 2020 year, it was a pilot. Not all of our students were a part of reflex math. This year, our data represents the same, uh, this year's current elementary population. Um, and we have uh, more students enrolled uh, in, in this program. So what we're seeing this year is uh, a 66.7% uh, fluency rate. And we have about 49% about of our students still working towards uh, building uh, full fluency, but are still um, at developing fluency. And that is a higher rate than we saw last year. But again, we have to caution the analysis here because I don't actually have apples to apples. So that's why you don't see any statistical analysis. It's just a presentation of the two graphs. Um, we also looked at math referrals um, from the school, from the four elementary schools um, in terms of support. Last year, uh, it, again, this was another place where we were unable to draw real meaningful uh, patterns. Uh, and that was because of the variation in what supports are provided. Um, as you can see last year, Foster and East both, East both supported grade one. Uh, this year, they're not in, uh, slated for, for, title, for, um, sorry, for elementary math tutor support. Although at East, this, there are small groups being run uh, by classroom teachers for math support. Uh, this is what grade two looks like. Um, again, uh, South Elementary noted that they're uh, providing teacher supports. There's no formal referrals for support, um, but we are seeing a 24% increase in math referrals at Plymouth River, a 4% increase at East, but we're actually down 22% uh, at Foster. And that could be due, again, to reallocating the resource to a new grade level. So it may be that Foster just doesn't have the same tutor time they used to have for first grade. Um, it's really not that less kids need it, it's that we're able to service less kids, if that makes sense. Um, and that plays itself out later where you'll see big increases. In grade three, across all four schools, you do see an increase in math support. Again, in grade at South, it's 18%, 1% at PRS, four at Foster, eight at East. In grade four, we're seeing a 20% increase at South, a 2% decrease at, Fo at Plymouth River, uh, a 21% increase at Foster. And again, that could be the first grade to fourth grade um, reallocation of resource. 
not necessarily that less kids need the support, it's that we uh, don't have the ability to provide the support to the same number of kids, and a 5% increase in re uh, referrals in, uh, at East Elementary in math. And this is grade five, up 31% itself, 2% at Plymouth River, down 14% at Foster, and 9% at East. And uh, we also looked at, as I said earlier, the, the grade distributions of grades being assigned to our students uh, across the secondary level, as well as information around the grade six math referrals. Uh, so again, this is the little table that shows uh, in 2019-20, 14 um, percent of our sixth graders were referred for math support. This year, it's 17 percent, representing a roughly 3 percent increase. And this is the table of the, the, the grade distribution tables for the middle school. Uh, again, you see the 1.2% 1, 1. reduction in A's, the 5.4% reduction in B's, the 3.5% increase in the assignment of C's, 1.4% of D's, and 1.7% uh, 7, 7 rather of F's. Uh, this is the same distribution for Hingham High School. Um, so we're seeing a 12% increase in uh, assignment of A's, a 10% decrease in B's, 3% decrease in C's, a 0.4% decrease in D's, but a 1.3% increase in F's. Um, I'll then turn our attention to the elementary social emotional learning screening data. Um, our elementary students are screened using the SRSS, which is the Students Risk Screening Scale. The SRSS consists of 12 items that teachers use to rate their classroom of students based on the teacher's knowledge and observation of each individual student's behavior. They're given 12 items and they're asked to rate those items um, how often they observe them occurring. Zero is never and three is frequently. <coughs> Excuse me, scores are calculated to form one of three risk categories, either low risk, moderate risk, or high risk. So the analysis we're gonna look at next is really just looking at kids identified as being high risk. Um, and what we, again, as I mentioned earlier, what we looked at was the screening data from the winter of 2020 or January of 2020 as compared with the data from this year of December of 2020. And again, we're seeing an overall decrease of 1.3% in internalizing issues, a 1.10 uh, decrease in the percent of kids with externalizing disorders. But again, what we have to keep in mind here is an overall total reduction in enrollment of 311. So I, I don't know how much of the, of the 311 reduction accounted for previous years of service. The other way to look at it is that um, our HTSS uh, social and emotional model is in year four, three right now. Um, and it very well could be that the interventions uh, from, from previous years uh, sort of were working. I, I'm not ready to sort of say why there's a decrease. I just know that we're not at the same level as we were, but we still have 105 students across the elementary level presenting with internalizing uh, problems and 24 uh, presenting with externalizing problems. Um, in terms of secondary data, so again, Hingham High School and Hingham Middle School, they administer the SDQ, which is the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire. And unlike the SRSS, this is actually a self-report. So for elementary, uh, the teacher actually completes the SRSS for the student. And at the secondary level, the student completes the screening themselves. So they're, um, we assess students functioning across uh, five domains, uh, emotional problems, conduct problems, hyperactivity and, and attention, peer problems, and then pro-social behavior. The first four of those domains, as you can see over here on the right, emotional problems, conduct problems, hyperactivity, impulsivity, I'm sorry, hyperactivity and attention and peer problems combine to form a total difficulty score or a total score. Um, and that creates a sixth scale. So, what I have here is the table uh, showing you the increase, uh, or in some instances, the decrease um, of, um, and I, I, to explain the left uh, column, that's total score, high risk, total score, some risk, emotional problems, high emotional problems, some conduct problems, high, and so on, hyperactivity and attention, personal problems, and then pro-social skills. And this is the um, looking at where the students were during the 2018-19 screening 
versus this year's screening. I will note, and I know Heather's on the call with us, our director of counseling, we were slated to deliver uh, the screenings uh, the week of the shutdown in March. Um, so that's why we don't have um, 1920 data, is the shutdown actually prevented us from doing those screenings uh, as they were initially planned to roll out. Um, literally, uh, the, the, the week after the shutdown was when it was all slated to begin. Uh, but we do have the ability to go back to 2018 and look at the performance of Hingham Middle School. And what we're seeing to the right-hand column is an overall increase across all uh, measures of some are high risk across all six domains of functioning. Total scores, emotional problems, conduct problems, hyperactivity and attention, personal problems, and pro-social skills. This is the visual representation of that same data. The lighter blue line represents where the middle school students answered uh, or self-reported back in 2018-19, and the darker blue line represents where they're self-reporting this year. This is the same data table for grade nine, looking at the grade nine from 2018-19 to the grade nine of 2020-21. Um, and again, uh, this is where we are seeing some minor decreases. For example, an emotional problem sum risk is down by 0.85, but not for high risk is actually up three and a half percent. That's where I mentioned earlier that there was some variation across uh, the individual scales. We're also seeing, for example, a, a reduction uh, by 0.59 percent of um, personal problems high risk, but yet an increase of 3.8 percent of some risk. Um, and then the last, uh, and this is again, the representation of that same data just done visually as opposed to the table. And again, the lighter blue line is from two years ago. The darker blue line is this year. And this is the same longitudinal look at the class of 2020, looking at where they were in grade nine versus where they are now in grade 11. And this is the visual representation of that data. So again, the lighter blue line is from two years ago. The darker blue line that you see uh, pretty above that lighter blue line is the current year screening. Uh, then we'll turn it over for the next couple of slides to Dr. Suzanne Vinnis, our Director of Student Services, to talk a little bit about special education eligibility rates. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, as Dr. Labillawa mentioned earlier, the number of students found eligible for special education so far this year, and of course it's only February, um, has increased by 68% of those found eligible um, during the entire 2018-2019 school year, um, and 46% um, increase of those found eligible in the entire 2019-2020 school year. It is important to note that we did have to um, stop um, evaluations for a brief period of time uh, during the closure from March to June, but resumed those evaluations um, starting in July uh, when we could start to um, do in-person uh, sessions safely. Uh, you can see um, in the chart below uh, the longitudinal data um, from 2016 all the way to the current year, you can see the number of initial referrals, um, which are students who um, had either previously been uh, exited from special education and needed to go through the eligibility process again, or um, mostly new referrals for special education. And as you can see, um, the percentage of students being found eligible for special education um, has increased um, quite significantly. Um, you can go to the, the next slide. So here you can see um, a visual representation of the very um, chart that was just on the previous screen. So you can see the, um, the blue line there are the number of initial evaluations that were completed in each year. The orange line are the number of students out of the um, total number evaluated who were found eligible. Um, and then you can see the gray line at the bottom that represents the percent of those students found eligible. And as you can see um, this year, um, we have a 79% um, positive eligibility rate, um, which means we have um, a significantly um, increased amount of students found eligible for special education this year. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Dr. Venice. 
Um, so just a couple of uh, final slides before we turn it back over to the community for questions and then to the community. Um, but we are, you know, I want to be really clear with the community that we are preparing for a full reentry. And I, and I want to be clear that data and the data that I just presented is only one part of the full picture of how students are doing. Um, you know, we have to remember that our students, our faculty, our staff and community have collectively lived through a global pandemic. Um, and I also want to highlight for folks, you know, as uh, those of us that sort of know this work well in education, um, you know, when we look at what, what do we know matters, right? Like, so what are the variables that we know make a difference in student achievement? One of the biggest ones is really there is a clear correlation and connection between teachers' feelings of efficacy or, or if, versus, um, sorry, uh, there is a clear connection between teachers' perceptions of self-efficacy and student achievement. So when teachers believe they can make a difference, they do. And so part of the work that we'll be doing is to really focus on our teachers to make sure that they're supported. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just aware of, of some of the narrative in the, it, that we hear sometimes around the work of our teachers and, and, and that really does impact morale. And, and what we do know is low morale uh, can lead to low student achievement. So, so I, I really need to, to sort of um, uh, encourage everybody on, in, our, in our faculty, in our community, uh, our, our leadership team to really um, do everything we can to support um, the, those, the, 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 that teacher efficacy, right? To support our teachers, to know that they're doing the very best work that they can do. And in fact, they are the biggest variable, <laughs> the biggest variable in student achievement is teachers. That, when teachers believe they can do it, when teachers feel supported, uh, students achieve. Um, we also need to really be focused on the balance of the needs of our students' academics with their social and emotional learning. The secondary, overall secondary increase in um, uh, social and emotional concerns is concerning to us. Um, it will make no, it will, do, any, it will do, do nobody any good to have a student who's a wizard math but really can't relate to other people or who really has a hard time managing their own emotions and feelings. So we really need to focus on both parts of the student and really develop the whole person, right? The academic, the scholar, as well as the, the emotional intelligence. And we also, uh, what we haven't really covered here, but I want to really just make a point of saying to everybody that, that to know that we recognize it is the impact of the loss of non-core academic programming and departments to our students. So our students who hi historically may have found a home in the, with drama or with music or in some athletics or some school-based activities that really aren't running in the same way. And, and for some of those kids, that was their only connection really to school, right? They were not, they, they had other outlets, other connections uh, that they're not getting right now that we need, really want to be thoughtful of. So not just the core academics across those five subjects, but also all of their academic offerings have been impacted. As we look to the future, we will be looking at some global focus points for further management and, and development as we work toward reentry, and that's going to be our curriculum. So we do know coming out of this year that we will have to make some curriculum adjustments to ensure uh, that we address any um, learning, learning loss or learning gaps there, there may be. We will also be focusing a real clear focus, I should say, on academic skill development. Um, so again, those early reading skills that we saw uh, just a few minutes ago, um, the overall uh, decrease in grades in terms of the higher proportion of kids who might be failing, um, those are all pieces for us to be really thoughtful of in building um, academic skill, as well as the social emotional uh, learning of our students. And really, uh, one of the biggest focus points for us next year will be the actualization of the full HTSS model or the Hingham tiered systems of support. And so in that vein, I did want to draw a clear connection for folks um, in terms of the areas that we've identified as being of need with our uh, current budget requests. So in terms of elementary reading, we're hoping to address those reading gaps and those reading issues with the existence of our, our reading specialists. And those are italicized because we already have those people on staff. Um, what we're looking to add are the four uh, literacy specialists. So our reading specialists would sort of really be focusing on the K to two grades. Um, our literacy specialists would be working more globally with grades three to five, as well as one elementary wide writing specialist. In terms of elementary mathematics, we are looking at bringing on two additional full-time math specialists to bring our total number to four. Um, and in terms of support staff, we're looking at bringing on academic interventionists as well as math paraeducators, as well as 
um, really looking particularly for elementary reading at universal comprehensive comprehension and writing screeners. Now, that's not to say we don't have them currently, but um, we, we haven't been using consistent tools every year. And in fact, over the last few years, as we've been piloting to get ready for HDSS, we've actually been piloting different data systems that have different components. So heading into next year, one universal uh, system is really where we're looking to sort of grow the district toward. In terms of second uh, middle school academics, again, um, we already have the two reading specialists in place. Our goal is to get them out of special education service delivery, reallocate that service to our uh, special educators and really turn our reading specialist attention. Um, not only, of course, there will be some specialized reading support, but also uh, supporting uh, students who might be struggling. Um, we're actually looking at the addition there of a 1.0 math specialist, 1.0 writing literacy specialist, bringing on an, an interventionists, as well as looking at a universal screening and looking at the master schedule to be able to provide times during the day for students to actually receive intervention. Uh, Hingham High School academics, we're really looking at the FTEs to really address the class sizes, um, as well as supporting and staffing our directed study program, which is where we do deliver some study skills and support to students who might be who might need it during a directed study. In terms of social emotional learning, we are looking to bring on two elementary wide adjustment counselors um, and a high school guidance counselor, as well as looking at the middle school and high school schedule um, to, again, find blocks of time to actually deliver the service and the support, as well as our membership back in the interface referral system to allow our counseling staff the ability to make outside referrals. And finally, in terms of special education, you'll see the addition of the 2.0 special ed teachers, 1.0 language-based uh, uh, program, special educator, an additional high school special educator, three additional speech and language pathologists, an elementary administrator of special ed, and a secondary administrator of special ed. Uh, not only to improve the current service delivery, but to also address uh, the growth of the population that we've seen um, over the course of this past year. And with that, I will come out of the share screen and be happy to take any questions or uh, feedback from the committee. I just want to thank you very much to you and to Dr. Venice and your team. That was a tremendous amount of work to do to put that together and um, it's a very thorough analysis. And I really appreciate you drawing the budget um, um, connection with it too, because I think I think that's important for everybody to hear. Um, I just had a, a couple of things. I don't think I don't think anyone's really surprised by this because you know we're we're all in the we're parents, we're in the community. Um, but it's really sobering to see the numbers, and I, I think it's concerning. It's something we're going to have to uh, really pay attention to and put some resources behind. Um, and I just you you had talked about the importance of the teachers' social emotional health to be able to do their job, and I think also as as a parent. And, um, and I think most parents can relate to that. With, with children, if they aren't okay on a social emotional le level, it's really hard for them to make any academic progress. So I, I agree that that's something we have to pay attention to. Um, I just had two questions then and I'll see if anyone on the committee has anything. Um, for the elementary SRSS, um, I was wondering if the hybrid model had any impact on the accuracy of the teacher's ability to uh, rate students as they had in the past. Just it's a very different environment and they don't spend as much time with them. Do you have any sense if that yeah, we had a similar conversation, Carrie. We were sort of wondering if the same thing, if that was the same thing, if that very issue of them not um, being with them as often or now I, I'm not going to suggest our teachers don't know our kids. I think they do. But I also I don't know. Um, we'd have to really find out from the teachers right around like, did you maybe hesitate because you weren't sure or, or maybe there are just less kids too, right? Like I, I don't, there's really no way to really quantify. All I know is that overall, there's been a general reduction, but we've also seen an overall reduction in enrollment, right? So I don't know how much of that is tied to less kids being there um, mm -hmm. versus less need, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. And then um, for the math um, interventions, you had mentioned the elementary schools and in some levels they weren't serviced because of lack of resources. Correct. What happens What happens to children who need math support and there just isn't a math specialist there available for them? What happens? Um, 
I, I mean, I, I might defer to my elementary principal colleagues to help out here. Uh, just be, so it's not that it's not that they're not. So what that was looking at, I should have clarified. So thank you for that question. That was looking at the number of referrals to our tutors, not necessarily who's working with the specialists. Mm -hmm. um, so our specialists do run our uh, Math Plus Advanced Program, as well as supporting uh, some teachers and some students and curriculum rollout. Um, so that's not to suggest that there's no access to those people. It's just that those schools weren't necessarily referring to tutor-based support. Um, and so we looked at tutor referrals in mathematics. Um, if any of the other principals want to jump in there uh, to talk a little bit about how we do provide support to math, I'd appreciate that. Just to get a building-based perspective would be helpful for clarity. Sure, um, I'm happy to speak about that. What we would do is the teachers are fantastic at differentiating. So they take small group, you know, they might take an individual child this year, or in previous years, they would work with small groups and they would provide some differentiated instruction. We also have excellent paraprofessionals who work in our classroom, so they might also provide some different supports. Uh, so we have other staff members as well as the classroom teachers themselves who provide that math intervention and support. And you can see on this on, on some of the on some of the tables, we made a note that there may not be any tutor referrals, but the teachers are running actually small group support groups, right? right? So some of it right. the teacher. Yeah. And some grade levels because of availability of, of people that we could hire, have people, have another person in the classroom. So that might be true at one grade level, but, but another grade level did so they got more of the tutor support. Right. So we had to make sure to, you know, um, divvy everything out. So you're right, they're getting it through differentiation and other people in the classrooms, and then the tutors are making up for the other grade levels. Thank you, that's helpful. Um, does anyone else on the, in the committee have any questions? Jen? Um, I just had a question going back to the, the reading skills, and you were talking about the fourth and fifth graders, and that you didn't, look at the entire grade, looked at the, the students that were for support, support versus the uh, previous years. Was those groups of students that were referred for support, was that, did you see an increase or a decrease in, in those groups? Like in fourth grade, it would have been higher, a higher group of students were referred for support compared to previous years? Oh, I didn't know. I didn't, so, um... We didn't do we didn't do an enrollment analysis because the what we looked at was the end like the group from this year who needed it versus the groups from previous years that needed it. So I could go back and look at just a, the, what that N was like. So we know that this year's N, I right, bear with me for a second. This year's N for um, I'm just going back when I was when you were showing the math. That's what just, that's what made me think of it. Right. So like, for the math group, like this year. There's, uh, for example, in terms of, oh, for math, you're saying, right? Well, no, I was, just, I was sorry, I clarified. When you showed the, the diagram of the math, that made me think of what were they for the reading. Oh, I, see, I see, okay. Um, no, but like, I, I can go back and look. So what I do know, Jen, for example, is this year in grade five for fall screening, we had 59 students referred and who were uh, given the oral reading fluency words read correctly, right? Or oral reading fluency and looked at accuracy and words read correctly. That was 39. For the past nine years, that number was 259. So I don't know from like last fall to this fall what the increase of the N was. I just looked at whether their mean performance was different. But I can go back okay. if, if you'd like to still look at that more carefully. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Does anyone else on the committee have any questions? Yes? Hi, thank you so much for pulling all that together. Um, I'm curious about the increase in the special ed. So do you think it's an increase in the kids who have true disabilities or do you think it's an increase because there's such a, a wide gap between the average student and what these students are missing? It, what I'm trying to figure out is, is it a disability issue or is it a missing um, lack of opportunity? And so there, the, the gap is getting bigger. Um, what I would say is that without a solid um, tiered system of supports to um, address student needs as they come up, um, 
will have an impact on the number of students who are found eligible for special education because we use um, the model where if there's a discrepancy between cognitive ability and academic performance, um, students are found eligible um, generally under specific learning disability. Um, what is going to be interesting, quite honestly, though, is, you know, if our norms have changed, um, I, it, we may see an increase anyway because the norms that we use based on our standardized assessments, um, there's going to be del a delay in how those norms are shifted as well because it's a national problem. Um, but what I can say is that I know that there are a number of students um, where we, if we had had um, more tier two intervention or tier three intervention for them, uh, we may be able to uh, curb any long lasting deficits. But I couldn't say for everybody, I would imagine there are a number of children who are found eligible and would have been found eligible. And, and I'm curious about the HTSS um, number of people that we're, we're proposing to add to the budget. Where do these people reside? Like, are they gonna be in the classrooms with teachers? They're gonna be floating? Are, are they going to need their own space? They will. Yeah. I mean, so so we are working throughout the entire elementary level and the middle school level to actually find space for them. Uh, but the, I, the, the vision is really to have them working uh, both with teachers themselves in terms of a coaching role, sort of supporting core instruction, working with our struggling students, uh, supporting the interventionists who are actually doing the boots on the ground support for kids. They might be taking some tier three groups or some, uh, some more uh, specialized tier two groups. So they're, they're really going to be sort of boots on the ground people um, who will be full time in a building. Um, and I think I, I don't want to speak on behalf of the principals, but I think I, I can here and say they will find any place in that building to house these people we just need them and and the location of them is less important than actually having the people um, so we do envision and, and by increasing the total number we actually increase the ability to service multiple grades at once so right now i've got one reading specialist for 500 plus kids who in any period of time can really only service one potential grade, right? And, and we are seeing that play out with our interventionists and our, tutor, our current tutors and our current specialist model, where we just don't have the bodies to cover all the grades who need support at the same time. So I'm not saying adding these couple people will fix that problem, but we'll be able to run sort of two simultaneous, maybe three simultaneous groups all back to back to back, rather than really reserving one block of time for one particular grade. Uh, but they will be building based, they'll be housed in the elementary schools, they'll be full members of the faculty, um, and they will have office space and likely shared instructional space. Okay. Um, and I think that was it for now. I, you know, I, I'm just curious about the, like the counseling, I think about where we are in this pandemic, and I wonder if I see the numbers going up and the issues that the kids are having. If the kids were back in the building, say at, you know, if we could get Three, three feet um, with everybody, given they still have to wear masks, given they still have to sit up six feet apart from everybody, would we still be in the same predicament from a counseling perspective? Are they still going to be struggling? And if they are, which I suspect they would be, would it be the same percentage? So um, it just- I, I honestly don't know. Um, I think we'd have to wait and see. What we're, what we're really thoughtful of, Ness, is when we make a full return, um, what we do anticipate is um, sort of, for example, one of the reasons why potentially we're not seeing as much in externalizing issues, particularly in K to five, is the kids aren't there as much. And when they are there, they're engaged in four straight hours of learning, they're done midday, and they go home. So it could be that we're seeing a difference in the data, not because there's a real difference in student manifestation of sort of behavioral issues, but that we don't see them as often as we used to, right? So, so what we talked about today actually was when they are all back, what the counseling department is really focused on is building a comprehensive system of support to be able to identify them early, screen everybody, and really get the skills to the kids who need them before we actually have issues. And that's where this model becomes so incredibly important. Uh, by doing the universal screenings and actually seeing where kids are and then making interventions when we're seeing kids not where they're supposed to be, we feel like that's the most effective use of resources rather than waiting until it becomes more extreme or more challenging and that behavior then requires different intervention. I think, um, I, I hear your question and it's difficult for me to project, but I can tell you we are anticipating 
anticipating a general increase in these symptom this symptomology once the kids make a full return or are back with us uh, more frequently. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That was it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Liza, did you have one? Hi. Um, thank you, everyone, for the very detailed analysis. I know this is a national challenge of deficits and been reading numerous things in Ed Week about the challenges across the country. So we have this same challenges. Um, so grade one, um, it what struck me was grade one, a little different than the others, is grade one from your first data point was below because they had missed kindergarten, the end of kindergarten the year before. And so do you, have you thought about tracking this data going forward with the elementary school students? Because we know, well, this really shows this is going to be a prolonged years of making up these gaps. Um, do, do you have thoughts of how you're going to keep tracking the data or is it in the same way? Or are you considering other modeling of how to track it over the years? So as long as we don't change, and really the only place really, really we have this kind of t like, you know, decade worth of data is really in the dibbles with reading. So as long as we don't change that tool, um, we can actually continue to look at these same analyses for years to come and actually track and measure the extent to which our, our cohorts are catching up with sort of pre-COVID versus post-COVID. We could actually create different norm sets and actually look at this is the compared against pre-COVID versus post-COVID. What you know, what I what I would note for folks though is you go back and look at those slides, um, the averages, um, while they're different, they're not sort of out of the realm of like so it, like what we what, what, I don't want to minimize the what the data is saying, but I do feel like with um, the proposed model with a real focus, and you might see actually in the coming uh, months, uh, sort of summer support programs, those uh, skill boot camps coming back online, um, us really preparing for this full return. Um, it's really about um, us getting more time with the kids to teach them. <laughs> I, I, right? the, the, the one good news sort of uh, thing that we can take away, particularly from elementary reading, where really any measures underlying, measuring underlying sort of cognitive memory skills or non-skill-based assessment was pretty okay right like so their cognitive skills are there it's I, I think it's really a matter of us not being with them as frequently um, as we have been with the previous cohorts but we can let it directly to your question continue to monitor them in the same way and actually we'll have additional ways to monitor um, where we won't be having to wait until we're asking the community and the committee for this huge budget ask because we'll actually have these people in place who are doing this work more ongoing. And that, that's not to suggest the reading team is not already doing that, but again, giving the better resource to the people, um, really uh, bringing the math support online with the reading support. Uh, because if you look at the trend of data over time, math really does become our area of weakness as kids get older. So really trying to get at some of those skills early uh, is really of paramount importance. And right now we're offering almost sort of half the support um, in math than we are for reading, right? Yeah. So, we're so specialists versus two, but we can continue to track and monitor as long as you don't change the tool. Okay. Yeah, and, and I personally have experience with two kids having been in Title I reading and they catch up. <laughs> and when we do provide the supports, which I hope we can have even more to address this, you know, we can get there. So on, on math, one of my questions is we need, or do we have the analysis tools now and we just don't have the people to, because the tutors who are providing the support are also the ones doing the analysis. And so is the reason we don't necessarily have the analysis because we don't have the people to do, to conduct it. Um, I'll, I'll let Dave speak. He has certainly more experience in the district on this area, but I will say it's almost a twofold issue. So I, I think it's an issue of people, but, but I will say the teams have been actively piloting different measures. So I don't want anyone to, again, the analysis was looking at data points in which we had um, data from this year and then pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to last year, the district was actually piloting a different data system okay. and we never gave up dibbles, right? So, so we were trying some new things um, and somebody helped me with what we were doing last year. I'm drawing a blank. It was from. Um, you had the word 60? 
We were trying uh, this model, Star360. We, before that, we tried the NWEA. We, we, so we've been trying and piloting different things, but I'll let Dave speak more specifically to math. So um, the, the short answer is yes, it, it's a little bit of both. Um, I mean, we've been, I wouldn't even say that the ELA group is twice, you know, or that we're half of that because they have the four reading specialists and we have the two math specialists because their roles are uniquely different. And then there's a whole cadre of other people who do the Dibbles ass assessments, which are intense and take a lot of work, a lot of individual um, people hours to accomplish that. Um, and so we, we certainly do not have the staffing to provide something quite as intense as that. Um, but we also don't have the tool. We've looked at Easy CBM, we've looked at IXL, we've bounced around through some multiple things. Um, sometimes primarily because of the funding that we had from Title I, we were able to kind of wedge a tool in that we thought we could use because we needed the data, but then something like IXL relies heavily on reading skills. And if your reading skills, if you struggle with your reading skills, then inherently your math skills are gonna fall behind in certain areas of math that require the reading. So um, we have struggled to find something. So typically one of the other data points that um, Dr. Labilova pointed to that we don't have this year um, is sort of, you know, we have our cumulative assessments in everyday math that are the common assessments that we fall back on, you know, every, Chapter two, four, six, and eight, they come back and it's a cumulative assessment over the course of the year. And we keep sort of cycling back through the data. So we have multiple checkpoints throughout the year sort of internally in that everyday math program that allow us to go back and look, you know, over time, we understand where kids should be kind of falling on those assessments. And that helps us with our referral problem. Uh, no problem, but our referrals, it helps us identify kids for our win blocks, things like that, because we have that data and we've had it over time. Um, this year in particular, we started late, so that pushed the timelines off, but then we, one of the major things that we did to sort of cut back on, to give more time to instruction was to cut back on those cumulative assessments in particular, um, because we felt it was more important to spend time with the kids learning than having the kids sit there and take tests. We always feel that's you know, a, a better use of time. So that traditional data that we have, um, we don't have in the same way anymore. Um, I think the other thing to kind of think about as we've sort of transitioned over to the standards-based report card, um, we've asked teachers to shift their thinking away from percentages and, oh yes, on the chapter four cumulative there, you know, we see, you know, this many kids that earned in the 70s, this many kids that earned in the 80s, they're now thinking about whether kids are meeting standards. And that's great and appropriate, but it takes away some of that data that we traditionally would have had over time where you'd say, oh yeah, typically we have a couple of kids, you know, in a group of 20, you'll have a couple in the C's, most would be in the B's and you'll have a couple A's, have whatever that breakdown is. Um, that data has sort of gone away over the last three to four years as we've switched over to the standards-based report card as well. Um, but I don't know if I'm answering directly your question or if you have a more pointed question, Liza, I can. No, I, I'll look into it later. I, it's a, yeah. such a big question, so. Um, um, obviously I'm happy to talk to you more outside of the meeting setting. Okay. Um, and then one other question, on the high school grade analysis, um, th that's a lot of A's. Um, and I hope that means that kids are focused, um, because, you know, for whatever reason this year and are doing well, or is, um, and I dared, well, I hope there's not great inflation, but is it also based on the mid-year semester grade? Yeah. So the analysis was based on the end, the, the, the term one and term two grades. Combined. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, all right, I, I think we should look at that. And then, you know, if they didn't have midterms this year, which could benefit a lot of kids. We, we well, took that out of the data from last year. Oh, you took the midterm test out? And that we were comparing the same. Yep. Apples to apples. And they were still higher? Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I that it strikes me as something to look into that if kids are 
honestly doing better. Like there's there's a reason why they're doing better. And on the positive side, let's look, let's ask the kids, like, why do you feel more confident in what, how you're learning and um, take away is this is a good thing and let's keep doing the good things. I, I think a key point of that, that data and the middle school data too, is that we largely saw that a lot of kids were doing really, really well. And we were pleased with that. Um, and I know in the conversations I've had with Dr. Laville a lot too, you know, one of the points of emphasis, however, was the kids who are struggling, maybe struggling a little bit more, mm -hmm. you know, and we saw, you know, kids who may, especially some, we, we see at, you know, certain ages, certain kids will really struggle in one particular grade and they'll be doing fine, but they'll, or one particular subject. Um, and that particular subject is maybe where it used to be a C is now a D or could have normally been a D and we were, you know, and it slid to an F because we're not there, like you said, we're not there the five days a week with the kid course correcting all the time. So that's, I think, where Dr. Lavilla comes back and talks about those needs mm -hmm. um, for the HTSS program. I think that's where the big part of it is. But I agree with you entirely. We have a, so many kids that are doing so, so well right now and really thriving as well. Um, it's really important to underscore their successes as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is all, it's kind of scary of the reduction, but let's take the good parts and build off of the good parts too. So it's data, it's data, it's good data too. So, all right, thank you. Thank you, Liza. Michelle? Thank you. Um, yeah, there is some really good data in here. Um, some of it's very sobering, as Carrie mentioned, a little bleak. Um, I was thinking, Suzanne, I, I, it's more of an anecdotal question, but I think my optimistic takeaway is going to be that Somewhere in there, I think that the results of the special education um, data, I would guess, shows that some children are being picked up that might have otherwise sort of slipped through the cracks. And that's a good thing because that's an opportunity to provide them the services um, that they would have need, but we may have otherwise missed had we not been in this situation. I did wonder, do you, have you seen any trends in the types of services, like speech and language, for instance, that you can sort of identify like, oh wait, we're going to have a real need here and that you can build some programming around or is this really across the board? Um, my thinking um, is that it is primarily in um, the reading and the math domains and specific skill areas. Um, and right now we see a, a large amount of students really struggling with the organizational capabilities of um, remote learning and multiple Google sites and um, different schedules every week. And so that, that is layered on top of um, some already existing challenges and in, in some content domains. Um, I would say that you know speech and language is unique in that um, it, it really, um, reaches through all aspects of learning and development um, and engagement. Uh, and so I see those numbers increasing um, at, a, at um, a rate as high as our reading instruction because it's all interrelated with one, one another. We wouldn't necessarily see those increases in occupational therapy or physical therapy or vision. Um, uh, but we are seeing it in the academic domains. And I would say speech and language is completely connected and related to those. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's um, important because I think, and I do really appreciate all the work that went into putting this together because I do think this data will help. Um, I mean, it clearly has identified where the, the issues are, where the successes are. I think um, there are so many talented people in this administrative team who can get together and build the programming that we need to um, have the students succeed and recover from this. And we, I mean, and you know, to look at the optimistic side, we are very, very fortunate in this district to have a highly qualified um, faculty and staff. Um, you know, a lot of districts don't, don't have that designation. So that is going to be the key to getting the kids back to where they need to be. So thank you. Thank you. And Carlos? Carlos? Okay, so two questions, Carlos? perhaps. Um, so one is uh, 
if uh, Dr. Labolwa, if you could elaborate on the um, uh, uh, the you non know, process, the system that uh, the interface uh, refer system. Uh, what is uh, from when you screen the the, the students uh, to the referral? Uh, how long it usually takes for that to take to take place? Number one. Number two is. Um, why we are not screening the other uh, grades uh, at a secondary level? Thank you. I think I heard two questions there. Could I just make sure that I got them right? One was around uh, the interface referral system, and the other was relative to screening the, the grades that we screened for SEL. Was that? Right, Carla? Okay. Um, the interface referral system isn't our screener. It's actually a referral system through William James College um, that our, uh, the town actually, so, so a number of years ago, um, there was a grant through Plymouth County that actually bought all of our, all of the districts in, in, in the South Shore area, a membership. Um, that grant ended. Um, Dr. Gallo and I advocated at the time with uh, Patrick O'Connor. Uh, the state uh, legislator, came, they, they came through for us with a one-year grant to actually continue our membership. Um, and then that lapsed when we weren't able to get it in the budget from two years ago. Uh, so this current school year, and I believe, and Heather, I don't know if you're on the call still, but I think it might have been last year as well, um, we lost eligibility and partnership with the interface referral system. That would have been the place where our counselors, our, our guidance counselor, our adjustment counselors would have gone to refer a child and or family for additional therapeutic supports. Heather, was hey. it? I, Sorry. Jump in here. No, that's all right. You, you know this better than I. Jump in. <laughs> so um, the interface referral service is really when a student um, has a need for outside of school clinical mental health intervention. So just like a school nurse isn't a student's primary health care provider, the school counselor isn't a student's primary mental health care provider. And so students often need to do that clinical work. Um, or just have some extra therapeutic support outside of the school day to work because we don't want to, um, as a counselor, kind of call you out of class, get into the nitty gritty of your feelings and then try and get you okay and send you right back to class again. We don't do that kind of therapeutic work during the school day. Um, so when a student needs extra support outside for that type of work, the referral service will um, match a family with an available therapist who will work with the particular issue that the student and or family has. It will make sure that that therapist has the insurance that the family has. It will follow them through at least three visits to make sure that they are well connected connected and it's a good match. And then if it's not, they will help the family and the student through um, just maintaining a relationship with a therapist that will work for them. So it really, um, it is a really great service because as we all know, even pre-COVID mental health supports, community mental health and just individual mental health supports for adolescents and children is severely lacking. The number of therapists um, just available to work with kids is low in Massachusetts, across New England, across the country. Um, so that's an ongoing problem and the interface referral service just kind of helps be a missing link um, and get families connected to services that they need. So I hope that answered a question. And the second question, Carlos, we actually do, so um, two years ago in 2018, 19 was actually the high school's pilot year. And so um, the middle school did screen all three grades. So the data comparison you saw was the Hingham middle school grades from 2018, 19 to this school year with all three grades included. And the reason why we only did grade nine was because that was the pilot grade from when the high school piloted in 2018, 19. So we actually uh, this year do have data on all four grades, but they weren't presented in this context because I did not have pre COVID data on those same grades. Does that make sense? We were doing the impact of COVID. So this year they are all being screened, but if we go back to 2018, 19, that was the high school's pilot and they only, they piloted with grade nine. 
So that's where we have the grade nine, the class of 2022 from grade nine to grade 11, and then we can compare grade nine to grade nine. We also have uh, data for grades nine, 10, 11, and 12, uh, but we didn't present it here because uh, this was more about the impact of COVID versus where they fell with the screenings. Thank you very much. I think that's all the questions. Oh, sorry, Carlos, do you have something? Okay, um, I, I think we're good with the committee. I see a number of hands up, so I'm, I'll call on you and uh, Julie will ask you to unmute yourself. If you could start with your name and address, um, we'll start with Michelle Duran. Hi, I'm Michelle Doran. I'm 919 Main Street, and I have a child in South School and one in the Middle School. Um, a couple of comments and then a question. First of all, all of this data, thank you, Dr. Jamie. I don't want to mispronounce your last name. Um, will this be made available so that we can digest it a little bit better as opposed is a lot of information that you presented tonight. So if you could post that. And I'm wondering if you if you have a slide on some of the, you know, all data and findings have some limitations. So some of the limitations that you outlined were comparable to baseline to now the hybrid learning and how teachers may not necessarily have as much in-depth knowledge as with the children. Um, and I also think maybe a confounding variable that wasn't mentioned is that a lot of parents are supplementing their children's academic learning right now with their input and also private tutors. And I'm wondering if that has been taken into consideration. I also want to just, and I'd love to hear the answer to that. I also just want to say, um, I think to Liza, you mentioned a couple of times about catch up. I'm not so sure that I'm convinced that um, the catch up is going to happen, especially for younger kids with this foundational, um, with their foundational skills in education. I don't know. This is an unprecedented time. I don't know what the literature says on catch up for children who have missed so much. Um, and my last comment, and then um, Dr. Jamie, I'm sorry again if I don't pronounce your name correctly, uh, um, if, if you could answer that other question about the, the parental involvement and the tutors, is I think this data is all great, but for me as a parent, it's more validating than new discovery. But I understand that data persuades and you have to have data to make change, but I don't think this isn't what we all expected to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, and I agree. <laughs> it's not really that surprising. Um, Jamie, will this be on the website? It will, yes. Okay, great, thank you. And did you wanna answer the? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I to Michelle's point, there's lots of variables that could account for that difference, right? So I, I think um, we're not ruling any of them out and, and parent private pay for, t for tutoring or support certainly plays a role. Um, but th th with all that aside, our responsibility is to the children of the Hingham Public Schools, right? And we now know um, beyond a doubt, frankly, that, the, 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 that what we've all observed qualitatively has been quantitatively shown. And so I think that that's really key. I, I think what we have to be responsible for is the provision of that support to kids in our school system during our, our work day. Uh, we really shouldn't have to have parents, right, in a position where they have to privately fund. Um, it's it's certainly, I'd have to find out the end of students this year who are getting privately supported and then go back for the last 10 years and figure that number out to then have that account in the analysis. But at the end of the day, really, from my thinking, and Michelle raises some excellent points, uh, but at the end of the day, the, they're significantly lower, right? Uh, and, and, and why is almost less important to me than, than getting, working on getting those skills back to where they should be. But, but, but again, I, I think there's a number of variables, right? Parent support, the structure, the hybrid learning model, the shutdown in the spring, we have to account for that time when there was no instruction, right? Other than keeping things going, right? For those months back when we first shut down. So I think um, there's lots of variables as to why, um, but the outcome um, really uh, it needs to be around the provision of that support uh, to our kids that need it the most. Thank you. Uh, next we have Megan Barr. If you could just say your name and address, please. Sorry, I didn't have a question. I My thing just went on. Thanks. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Eileen Bevins? Hi, Eileen Bevins, 8 Plymouth River Road. Uh, thank you for all the information tonight. 
I'm not seeing any academic data for the high school level and the high school students seem to be overlooked in this report other than the social emotional data. And I'm not sure that looking at grades year over year is an accurate assessment, given that the grades can be subjective. Um, I think, and rightfully so, kids have been given a bigger break this year on things they have in the past. Um, the high school students don't have years and years to catch up academically, which makes them even more of a priority in my uh, mind. Yet the focus seems to be only on the elementary level in terms of sharing data, tracking data, and getting kids uh, more time in school. And I feel like the, the need for high school is immediate. Um, they're literally competing for college spots in the near term with students who've been attending school in person and full-time all year across the country. It's a national challenge, but it's not a consistent national challenge. Um, as you know, I've looked at the numbers. Um, the high school students are receiving more than 25% less instruction time in each course subject than they would have received in a typical year. This is equivalent to about two months less of school for each subject. The teachers are doing their best, and I've been fortunate enough to see this firsthand, um, but it's too much that they asked, they're asked to cover an entire rigorous curr curriculum with less time. So I guess, how can we find out if there's great inflation? How are we assessing what parts of the curriculum are not being covered due to the shortage of instruction time? And how can you make requests as for budget that these students have missed, given that great data is not really a true assessment of learning. Okay, thank you, Eileen. Um, do you wanna address any of those? I mean, I can address what I can. Um, I, 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 I can only present the data that I have, right? So, so we don't, again, uh, we do not have the same skill-based data um, like we screen and track for our elementary kids that was presented this evening. I, I did not mean there to be any perception of not focusing on secondary. Uh, what the data we do have are grades. Um, again, some of the traditional common assessments or, or things we might have used to look at student progress were uh, may not be administering. For example, we couldn't look at the impact on exam uh, for our midterm exams or final exams, right, which are more quantifiable um, because we don't we're not we didn't do them this year. So again, the 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 presentation was really trying to quantify uh, pre-COVID, uh, the impact of COVID sort of looking pre and then post. Um, and so I, I don't know what else to say beyond I don't have the data at the secondary level in the same way that we have it at the elementary level. Um, I do not believe that there is great inflation. I'd have to work with the high school team to sort of get a firmer response relative to that question. Um, uh, the, the high school leadership um, is very thoughtful on supporting children. So I, I think um, if I was seeing uh, uh, the, the same point, though, um, we're not seeing an increase in the assignment of upper level grades, which actually suggests some kind of a widespread inflation. Uh, the actual N we're talking about is, uh, is a couple hundred, um, but those are not kids. Those are grades. Right, so one child could have six to seven grades and those seven grades dump into that analysis. So it's not that that many number of kids are getting A's, it's that the, and across all five core content areas, they've assigned that many more grades, A's this year versus last year. Um, but it doesn't, I don't see a pattern that played out there that would suggest widespread inflation. Um, and I, I don't recall, I think there were three points and I only covered two. I don't recall the third. Do you happen to remember? Was there another area I didn't cover? Um, no, I think, I think you, I think you got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, next. Uh, wait. Oh, oh. Uh, Jason O. Oh, can I, can oh, I, sorry, can sorry. I just make yeah. sure? I understand that we don't have the data, but is there any plan to, assess these students. It seems like, you know, saying that we don't have the data is not necessarily good enough. I mean, what are we doing to assess where these kids are and what they've missed? And it doesn't seem like that's something that's happening. Well, I think it's coming. I think the challenge that at least I'm having is the base assumption that like the, the, and I, I'll turn also to our sort of um, curriculum leadership team that's here as well with us this evening. 
um, they've adjusted what the kids are learning um, to align with those standards, right? So, so I don't have the same ability to, I mean, I can go in and look at um, where kids are, for example, with reading comprehension in uh, a, a primary text in social studies, but I have, like, that's not an anchor into the grade or the content area that the kids are actually learning in. Um, so it becomes more challenging. I'm not suggesting that we're not looking at it, but it's not going to, it's not, it's not sort of manifesting in the same way as we might see with basics, for example, literacy skills that we actually do screen multiple times a year and track and manage at the secondary level, the focus moves away away from academic skill to academic application of that skill across content areas. And it also introduces um, deeper level content for learning. So we're no longer teaching the basics. Now the kids are getting more in depth and, and application and synthesis of those earlier skills. And the way that we generally look at that is through comparable common assessments, right? So I can look at all sections of, um, I don't know, uh, algebra and sort of see how they performed on these common assessments across the algebra course. Um, and that's how we would look at that, right? So we, so we do have systems in place to track and make sure kids are progressing through the curriculum, um, but it doesn't take the same form as how we conceptualize it for our elementary learners. Um, I don't know if any of the directors wanna jump in and sort of help clarify a bit. Yeah, I think I would add to that, Dr. Labilla, that um, with, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different things that go into there. I, I hear uh, what, Ms., what Mrs. Bevins is saying entirely about days on learning and sort of the scheduling, yeah. but we also pick up a lot of time, you know, we did some things um, in terms of canceling midterms, in terms of, you know, we don't have field trips, we don't have assemblies. There are a lot of places where we also got back a lot of instructional time that People don't see like, oh, you didn't have, you know, 30 minutes of your math class today because you had an assembly or you didn't even go to school. Well, not go to school, but you were on a field trip today. Uh, there's band trips, there's chorus trips, there's athletic trips. There's all these things that also sort of play into the time on learning. So um, I'm not saying that it's apples to apples, but there is certainly a, a things that we're doing to get some of the time back. Um, and then in terms of the curriculum planning, you know, math in particular, um, you know, we, we see a lot of skills that sort of play out across three different grade levels. And so, you know, what we can shift and move probability standards from algebra one to algebra two, because we know we're gonna have more time to do them in a couple of years. Um, there are things where we may spend, um, I think the enrichment part, and I know Mrs. Roberts has sort of spoken about this the last couple of meetings, um, in terms of like labs, but you know, from a math standpoint, where we may, um, you know, spend some time talking about parabolas and developing how to look at the minimums and maximums and expand them and understand uh, the zeros and where they hit the axis and you know, what is the actual practical application. In the past, we would do different projects that may take three, four days, and we might really spend a little lot of extra time in class going into something, maybe because it's more fun. Uh, maybe because it's more enriching, and we would pick and choose our spots. Um, and so some of those real enrichment opportunities aren't happening now. Um, the instruction's there. The kids are still certainly learning the skills. They're still applying the skills. Um, but we also might look at something where it'll be applied three years in a row, and we might say, this first year, we're going to introduce it, make sure the kids understand the skills, uh, use our common end-to-unit assessments, and have those discussions with our teams to see if the kids are on target. And then from there, um, we're keeping sort of tallies of what we are covering, if anything needs to be shifted. Um, that was work that we started all the way back, and I would say this across all the disciplines. We started last spring sort of keeping track of, you know, what ideas, what topics, what things needed to be shifted so that we could take care of kids over the next <coughs> four to 12 years, depending on what grade level they're in. Um, to make sure that we're sort of closing some of those gaps. So um, that work has been ongoing and is, you know, will continue to be ongoing and it's stuff that we're not going to solve all the issues right now, but we'll be able to be in good position to help support those kids and understand, you know, as a whole, what uh, major gaps we may have to address curricular wise um, in our content areas. Okay, thank you. Um, next we have Jason O. Oh. 
Hi, it's actually um, Katie O'Leary. I'm sorry, it's under my husband's name. Okay. I'm at three Bucket Mill Lane, um, and I have three elementary students at Plymouth River School. So um, I'm just, I would like to make two comments and just ask a question. Um, and the one was, I, I understand um, there was a lot of put, a lot of work put into the data and no, um, it's not perfect. But um, the one issue I saw with the social emotional assessment for the elementary school children mm -hmm. is the lack of input from parents. Um, you know, I have a first and third grader who are asynchronous two days a week. Um, so there's no way their teachers could really see their emotional behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, when I did address it with their teachers, they were so surprised because they said when they're in school, they're so happy mm -hmm. and fully engaged in learning. So the issues are not present. Um, and their teachers were very supportive and were concerned for their well-being, but they couldn't do much for them because the, they're presenting these behaviors at home. It's just an increase of anxiety, depression, you know, Sunday night. Their cohort B, so they they're on Zooms Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So you know the tears start flowing. They don't want to get on their Zooms. So it's a lot of emotional issues we're having. So I just want to make sure that the support is there for all of the students in case these uh, uh, emotional issues manifest when they return to school full time. Because as a parent, I see it at home, and I'm grateful that they are participating in school and on, and are you know doing well with their teachers, but as a parent, it is, that's not what I'm seeing. And it's very distressing for uh, me. And I just want to make sure they have that support. Um, and also um, I'm, I agree with the earlier comments regarding the supplemental help that a lot of these students are receiving, you know, for our first grader, she was so far behind her reading fluency. So we did supplement with a tutor at great expense. So we're hoping when she does return to school full time, you know, she will receive the services that she needs. And I just want to make sure that, you know, in the budget, we have these resources for these young readers, because I could see this being an issue moving forward. Um, and my question is, is um, I would love to see the school year extended. You know, when our children finally go back time, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that they will go back full time March 15th or by March 15th but they will have missed an entire year of school. And I know the school year is supposed to be 170 days, but I'm asking for it to at least be increased to the 180 day standard. I just think they are so far behind, have missed so much. And I think it would really benefit them to have some more in-person learning. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your comments. And I think it's a good point about um parents being looped in and they're especially this year seeing um different social emotional challenges that may be different than years past i don't know uh, dr labola i don't know if you want to address any of those yeah so in a typical year um you would have received communications from if we go back for example a couple of years ago parent input actually is critical because the elementary screen and and um you know, I don't want to take up too much time, but there was a lot of discussion when we first rolled out about whether to use a self-report or a, um, a teacher report or a parent report. And we ended up going with the teacher report supplemented by parent feedback. So um, what would happen in a typical year um, is that we would do the screenings and then we would also send out a communication um, to, the, to that school saying, if you have any concerns, let us know. And we've actually picked up a lot of kids for support based solely on parent referral. The, the reason why I don't have that data um, is because it's not a structured part of the screening. So again, it's not to suggest that um, everybody's fine, right? What we were presenting tonight was trying uh, my best to quantify the actual impact of COVID and looking at the places where we had data pre-pandemic versus post-pandemic. I think the, the, the past that, that uh, speaker uh, is right on. I mean, we do rely heavily, particularly with our elementary age students, on parents also being um, a partner and letting us know when there are concerns. Um, we are, uh, again, uh, trying to uh, introduce a multi-tiered model of intervention for reading, introducing, reallocating our reading specialists to really focus on our primary grades, introducing four new full-time literacy specialists, 
um, one full-time district-wide writing specialist at Cross Elementary, as well as two additional adjustment counselors across the elementary level to, again, to account for this social emotional increase. Um, I don't have uh, the regulatory authority to talk about extending the school year, so I'll leave it there, uh, Chairperson Nee, relative to what I could answer. Um, okay. But uh, in terms of parent input, it is critical, um, and parents are our biggest allies when it comes to supporting the social emotional wellness of our kids. Yeah. And I just want to say, too, what we asked Dr. LaBella to present, we, we kind of strongly suspect that there's been student learn, learning loss and a real social emotional impact, but we, we wanted him to try to quantify it as much as possible. So that required him and his team to pull from whatever they had, any data from pre-COVID and that they could get now. So it may not get everything, but it's, it's giving us a, a clear picture of kind of what we thought was going to happen. So um, Liz Klein. Hi, Liz Klein, 12 Peter Hobart Drive. Um, thank you, Dr. Jamie, uh, for the presentation. I have one clarification and one question. Um, the clarification, it looks like the um, special education numbers have increased. And I just wanted to understand, is it that the percentage of students qualifying out of the number of students that are being screened is increasing? or are you really seeing a, a significant increase in the population or of students on IEPs? Um, so I, I believe the answer is both. So of the total kids referred for evaluation, right now we're running about 79% of those kids eligible. Um, last year, uh, th so that that seventy that that um, seventy eight percent or the seven. I have to go back to my slides. I'm sorry, I don't recall. Doctor Venice, this is your wheelhouse. <laughs> um, that's a really good question. Um, I'm going to try to put it together for you. So um, the numbers um, of eligible students uh, in total for the district is not. Um, exceeding previous years, um, but our numbers of students found eligible is high, and, and some of that has to be balanced with students who have made different choices this year. We know that the enrollment is different. That's impacting special education as well, um, and other uh, students have elected to go to other um, programs elsewhere. Um, and then there's also a number of students who um, are exited from special education every year because they no longer require special education. That number is, of course, very low. Um, and uh, only at 30 this year, um, previous years, it was closer to 60 and 80 of students being exited. So the way I'm interpreting this is that while the number of active students in special education right now are not exceeding previous years, they, it will. Um, because the trend that we're on um, is going in that, uh, in that direction. Uh, and the numbers I included are also students who are currently being evaluated. And so the outcomes for those students haven't necessarily been determined, but they're being, um, they're, they're being evaluated currently. Um, I think that yeah, I think may that help answer the question. I, what I, what I um, am thinking is that the impact um, of uh, COVID um, we are going to continue to see um, a ripple effect. Um, so I would imagine that um, over time, I see those numbers going up. Yeah, and just to clarify, if I have this right, students on IEPs are students with disabilities, and and because of those disabilities, need specialized instruction, right? Yes. So it's so it's um, so through the eligibility process, they are being found to have a um, educational. Um, disability based on the um, uh, based on IDEA, mm -hmm. and then they need that specialized instruction. It's not something that a couple of accommodations can help them. Correct, and in fact, so so when we were speaking before about um, HTSS and how important that is um, to provide targeted instruction to students who are struggling, um, who may in fact um, may not need special education, but they needed some targeted instruction um, that that has an impact, but it doesn't remove um, the eligibility process that we would continue to go through for all students. Who, Great who are the, where there's a suspicion of disability. Okay, thank you. Uh, Laura Achatella. 
Hi, Laura Achitella, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Laura Achitella for Boulder Glen Road. Um, I just wanna say thank you, Dr. Labilowa, for this presentation. Um, I've learned a lot, not just tonight, but really this winter about how much um, the tiered systems of support um, is going to um, change things in Hingham. And I think it's really going to make a difference over the long term. But I, I'm still very much concerned that the resources you're asking for, and I really like how you've um, outlined them in that chart, you know, putting the areas of need with your professional staff and support staff. I'm really concerned though that these resources just aren't gonna go far enough in the short term. So tonight you did a lot to um, document the need that's there, but can you help um, parents in particular understand why you're confident, why the curriculum directors are confident that this is going to be enough to make that difference next year and to um, help with the ripple effect in coming years. Uh, I just, I mean, I just think about, I'm taking math as an example, four math specialists, one per elementary school, there are six grades. I mean, how can one person um, really address all of these needs? I'm just wondering, Hingham has operated on such, um, a lean budget for far too long. And I'm just worried that maybe the ask isn't as big as it really needs to be this year. And so if you could just address that, you or the directors, um, is this gonna go far enough? Yeah, so Lauren, that's a, uh, Lauren, that's a great question. Um, and I appreciate how engaged you've been. I, I think your question highlights the importance of the overarching structure of the HTSS model and not just the people. So part of the introduction of the people um, is to support all learners, including really improving and enriching core classroom instruction. Uh, so one, you know, one of the questions we ask ourselves is do our classroom teachers have access to content area experts when they plan and develop their lessons? And, and by the introduction of a full-time sort of specialist level person for literacy, uh, for writing, for reading, and for mathematics to, to all um, uh, five of our schools, right? Our K to eight schools, uh, the idea is not only would we improve the targeted instruction, but we'd also use those people to also get at core instruction and improve the overall quality of the educational experience. So it's not just, for example, the kids who are struggling, it's sort of everybody. And to be totally honest with you, um, this is our best guess based on our experience, our knowledge of the community, our knowledge of our students' learning profiles, um, knowledge of the district infrastructure, the kind of support and, and um, uh, you know, resources that our classroom teachers need to do the job that we're asking them to do. This is where we feel like this pro this proposal proposal is um, with all that we know what we feel like is our best um, our, our, our best attempt to actually address these issues do I do I know if it will be enough I, I, I don't but what I do know is it's a solid place to begin based on the feedback um, of our of our senior administration our uh, department directors, our building principals, our APs, our tutors, the people, the actual specialists who are with us now. Um, this model really came from us saying to that team, if we could wave a wand, right, in, in, in our wildest dreams, what do we need to actually get this moving in the right direction? And what the, the proposal that you see for HDSS was that outcome. So, so what I, all I can do at this point is, is put faith in the experts that we have in place and sort of our knowledge of the district. Um, I don't know if it actually um, uh, will be enough, uh, but we do know that it's sort of what we all feel is an excellent first step to actually get that model moving and moving in the right direction. We're actually increasing, you know, two or threefold the number of people available for hands-on deck support, actually giving specialist level intervention and support to kids, uh, where historically they could get that through one reading specialist, right? Now we're introducing um, four additional people into their world, additional interventionists, that's full-time job, uh, will be to work with small groups of kids to move those skills. Um, we also hit a critical point where um, we have to be thoughtful of the number of people we introduce into a building, right? To make sure that there's adequate space and adequate adequate materials and adequate um, in environmental sort of pieces that they need to do the jobs that we're asking them to do. Uh, so to be totally honest with you, um, I don't have a crystal ball to sort of know exactly what it is, but the, the, what the proposal uh, in terms of the budget is based on our best um, 
known our, our, our best proposal based on our knowledge of the district and our knowledge of the students and our, of our teachers. Um, so I'm happy to sort of anybody else in the team wanted to jump in and add their perspective, but um, this is not, I also want to be clear, this is not new, right? So, so this model has actually been in development for the last three years. Um, and, and part of the reason COVID has really exacerbated right the existing gaps that were there prior all that the, the the shutdown and the pandemic has really done is sort of put those areas of discrepancy on full display right for everybody to see and and we've been working as a team internally on how best to get this model moving for a number of years um, so none of this was sort of a knee-jerk reaction to the pandemic it's really been thoughtful planning um, involving uh, upwards of 60 people uh, to really come to consensus on this makes the most sense for our school district. Um, so it's, it's our best guess at this point. Thank you. I appreciate it. We have a lot more to get to on the agenda. So I'm just going to take one more question on this. Um, but again, we're, we're all available uh, through email if you have any questions. And this, the presentation will be on the website too. So you, you, you'll have an opportunity to, to dig into the data yourself. So we'll just take one more from Joshua Ross. Hi, uh, Joshua Ross, 125 Wampatuck Road. Uh, I just, real quick, I, I would just piggyback on what Laura just said about the the need for, for the FTEs and the support staff. And I would hope um, looking at even next year's buzz, budget, you have a, a an early assessment on, on what you received this year and going forward to put into next year's budget. But my, I, two quick questions. One, on the, on the grades for the high school, what Liza was talking about, do you have a breakdown of what those were uh, between the hybrid students and what the remote students were? Because that would be, you know, an interesting analysis given the fact that, you know, a third of the high school is fully remote. Um, and so I think there's a big enough sample size there to see, you know, if there's a discrepancy in grades between the kids who are remote and the kids who are, who are doing the hybrid classes. My, my second real comment, I guess, last question is, you know, it's it's pretty apparent in 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 the presentation you gave, um, you know, with with all the sobering numbers and and seeing, you know, the four directors of the core subjects here, and going over all the assessments with Dibbles and MCAS, that, you know, the arts and the other non-core subjects are really getting sort of left behind. What it seems to be, so, um, I would hope that <clears throat> this is a clear picture that we absolutely need a fine arts director um, to deal with not only the assessment of, you know, the music kids, the drama kids, the photography kids, the graphic designers, the cooking, um, you know, whatever encompasses in fine arts um, to not only help with the assessments, but with the planning to, to for the classes, the electives to, um, you know, bridge those gaps for next year. So again, I, I know this is talked about a lot, but I hope um, going over all these numbers, that there really is a, a, a shows a need to put a fine arts director in for this year. So that's what I had. Okay, uh, thank you, Josh. Um, all right, so we're going to move on to communications. Um, we already did 5.1, which is student communications. 5.2 is communications received by the superintendent, Dr. Austin. Thank you, and. Uh... No, oh, you're muted. Sorry, I thought I unmuted myself. And I said, if I can have one less time that somebody says you're muted, that would be great. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, at a time when uh, it's often hard to get information out of Washington, that is really good news. But I'd like to share with you a letter that I received. And this is a, a letter from the National History Day, which is a very big part of our um, our program here at Hingham. And uh, we have many, many students who prepare um, to participate in that. But the uh, letter comes from the National History Day is a press release with Hingham educator named Contributing Teacher for Library of Congress National History Day Partnership. On from Washington, D.C. and Hingham is National History Day is pleased to announce uh, the selection of Miss Christina O'Connor, a teacher at Hingham High School in Hingham, Massachusetts, is one of only 15 educators who will create a valuable new classroom resource. These student guides will be the newest addition to the wealth of materials provided by the Library of Congress, Teaching and Primary Resources Consortium for educators in the United States and around the world. Over the next several months, 
Ms. O'Connor and the co-art contributors will work directly with the National History Day and Library of Congress staff to write and test a series of five student guides based on the five uh, National History Day pr project categories, which is documentary, exhibit, paper, performance, and website. The guides will help students find, analyze, and integrate primary sources for the Library of Congress into their National History Day projects. Ms. O'Connor's experience will include advanced virtual training with the Library of Congress and its TPS partners. Upon the guide's completion, National History Day will distribute the series online. Ms. O'Connor and her fellow contributors bring many years of classroom and project-based teaching experience to this endeavor, said Kathy, uh, Kathy Gorn, National History Day Executive Director. Through this new series, these teachers will showcase the library's primary source collections for the benefit of National History Day students for many years to come. We are grateful for this opportunity to work with the Library of Congress as create, creation partners for this important projects. The, cordon, the cohort of 15 teachers will begin its work with National History Day and Library of Congress staff immediately. The educators chosen for the program represent Illinois, Indiana, Kansas, Massachusetts, Nebraska, New Mexico, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Texas, Virginia, Washington, and Wisconsin. So very good news for that and congratulations to Chrissy O'Connor, uh, a great example of a fine educator uh, in the Hingham Public Schools. And this is nothing short of an amazing honor uh, and, and bestowed to a, to a very, very wonderful teacher. So thank you for letting me share that. Congratulations, O'Connor, and thank you for all your work on this. I think it's it's great. <laughs> so, next is 5.3 is other communications. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that um, we have a joint. The school committee has a joint meeting with the board of selectmen tomorrow night. It's the education budget hearing, so that's a big one. Um, so we will not be doing office hours, but we are planning to resume them on March uh, 2nd, which is a Tuesday night, and we'll publicize that too. Um, sixth is unfinished business, and 6.1 is to consider phase three reopening plan and act as appropriate. Dr. Austin. Thank you very much. And uh, as you know, uh, two weeks ago, I made a proposal and, and I have, uh, I'm just going to briefly go over uh, the PowerPoint with just a couple of small um, changes to that. Uh, and then you can uh, certainly ask questions and hopefully take some action on that. So thank you, Julie, uh, pulling that up. But first, just the, uh, you know, as we said last week, we're committed to increasing in-person learning for all of our students in the safest and most responsible manner. Um, we are the proposal tonight continues to prioritize our youngest learners and it's based upon the changing conditions of COVID. As we've heard before, that our numbers continue to go down. The anticipated availability of a vaccine for staff in the very near future, scientific evidence, the need to ensure consistent um, structured learning time experiences and includes reasonable measures to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 in our schools, which impact the health and safety of both staff and students. Um, again, we recognize how difficult the last 11 months have been uh, on our students, our families, and our staff. We understand that no plan during the pandemic will universally satisfy all staff, families, or students. However, we also understand that the impact of the uh, pandemic has had on student learning, and we've certainly just heard a lot about that tonight, and we must be fully committed to providing the supports and services necessary to every learner in our district. So why do we need to change? Just to re reiterate, uh, regardless of the quality of the online program, nothing can replicate in-person learning of our students, particularly our, particularly our youngest learners in grades K through five. And again, the data we just heard very much highlights that. Isolation from peers and educators impacts the social emotional well-being of both students and educators. And again, the data we hear supports that. Simultaneous teaching of students at home and in person is challenging, particularly for earliest elementary students. Uh, the longer we remain in hybrid, the greater risk for academic regression, particularly in our very young learners. And again, the data we heard tonight is that we must move forward now uh, and, and to prevent any further regression and to make up some gain uh, that we need to make. Students want to be in school daily to see their teachers. We know that. Families want to return to work and they want their students to return to the classroom. COVID-19 in our state, community, and schools is continuing to reduce, and science supports that schools can be operated safely with proper mitigation measures such as wearing masks, hand washing, surveillance testing, and maintaining physical distance, all the things that we're doing in our schools. So why are we doing this now? Foster North is open and operating. 
Elementary cafeteria and specialty spaces are now available that were previously used for classrooms and special education services. There has been no student in school transmission since mid-December. Staff testing has been initiated and student surveillance testing will be initiated. I'm sorry, I didn't update that after the February break. We are at this week, so I'm still on target uh, for that. The Hingham community responded to the request of lower community rates. Hingham has achieved yellow status for, it's actually four consecutive weeks now, uh, and the school age rates are the lowest uh, amongst those uh, rates. And the goal of 35 hours per week of, of structured learning time addresses in per, uh, address the in-person learning. So again, we to go over the proposal that HPS will transition from a hybrid learning model to full in-person learning model for grades one through five. All HPS grades K through five students will return to full-time in-person learning on or before March 15th, 2021 with grades one through five attending full days. Families will be asked to commit to in-person or remote learning to limit enrollment, which we do have a survey they went out today um, for classroom changes between in-person and remote learning students. Southeast Foster and the North Campus and Plymouth River will operate a full day schedule five days per week. The district will ensure three to six foot physical distancing of students in grades K through five. Again, it depends on how many students are in a classroom. Some have larger populations than others. So those will be closer to the three feet when smaller classrooms will be closer to the five or six feet. The school lunch program will resume the start of phase three and the district will ensure six foot spacing for all students during lunch, snack and mass breaks. The district will ensure that educators maintain at least six feet physical distance from students at all times. At the district's primary elementary learning model transitions to full in-person to remote learning, the remote learning program will be finalized once we receive the survey results from families to determine the numbers of children who are committed to either in-person or remote learning. We have been working on this right along. We are prepared to serve our, uh, service any number of students uh, that choose to be remote. We are waiting uh, as we will wait for the results of the survey to finalize that uh, in the coming week. So our proposal for 612 um, the administration proposes that our hybrid learning model will continue at the secondary level, but will be reviewed weekly. Uh, before I had monthly, um, we now are doing that weekly uh, for potential expansion. Each principal, which from the Hingham Middle School and Hingham High School, has established an advisory committee consisting of the respective councils with the addition of some very fine health sector professionals. We have great doctors on both of those panels uh, that are tasked to make recommendations to each principal for consideration, consideration of advanced in-person learning. Today, the actual the middle school uh, advisory committee met earlier today, and I believe that the high school group will meet on Wednesday. Um, and I'm hearing those are really productive meetings so far uh, with lots of things being discussed and, and hopefully some recommendations coming forward. We are very committed to moving forward into in-person learning to see how we can do that uh, in the very near future. And so I would say stay tuned uh, for the next couple of uh, school committee meetings to see uh, the potential of new proposals uh, in that regard. Effective honor before March 17th, students in grades six through eight will attend school in person on Wednesdays and alternating cohorts A and AB on the first and third Wednesday and B and AB on the second and fourth Wednesdays. We propose to expand in-person learning for students in grades six through 12, with an emphasis on increasing class sizes while maintaining the six foot physical spacing requirements at the time being. I will report at the next school committee meeting on March 8th, the number of students as we've moved uh, into that process since the uh, beginning of January, uh, when we started our new uh, process with this. Uh, and so I'll give you an update on that at that time. Uh, the synchronous learning model provides students with a strong engaging program. Uh, Hingham exceeds the DESI requirements, uh, we still do, for SLT and engagement compared to other districts. Uh, this provides us time to determine the appropriate plan. Uh, but once again, the, the groups are meeting now. We're gonna ask that they meet uh, weekly, uh, if at all possible, uh, and to, to make continuous recommendations uh, in getting the work done, so. So supporting evidence, uh, once again, the Hingham community uh, COVID-19 data is now yellow zone for the past four consecutive weeks. It is among the lowest per capita transmission rate on the South Shore. Positive cases are in a continued decline. As you see now, we're at 31 uh, cases per uh, 100,000, which is in the last four weeks has dropped more than half from the high of, I think it was 78 uh, at one point. 
Almost all cases reported have originated outside of the school setting. Uh, we still see that. We have very few instances where there were confirmed staff to staff, staff to student, or student to student transmission in the school setting. We have absolutely no confirmed student to staff cases. The district initiated our free COVID-19 test for staff in January. And at this point, we've had over 900 staff uh, tests completed, but only one uh, test uh, case reported, uh, a positive case reported for 0.11% um, positivity rate. The district will initiate pool testing for students with more than 900 families consenting to date, and that should start by the end of this week. For the elementary level, continued supporting evidence. We, the Hingham Public Schools currently has 1,521 elementary students attending in-person in a hybrid learning program. At, at this point, we have 134 fully remote students, which is a fairly consistent uh, 20 to low 30 uh, across the uh, grade span. Uh, again, we will um, certainly be monitoring that closely to determine how many will want to return. I do know that some will want to, uh, and others may be uncomfortable doing three feet. So um, we'll wait for that data in the coming week. And again, no staff to student, student to staff, or student to student in school transmission since the case of PRS in mid December that was quickly resolved. And secondary age children do represent a higher percentage of overall COVID 19 cases. Um, the CDC, DPH, and the American Academy of Pediatric continue to recommend caution in maintaining six-foot physical distance to the extent possible for this group. We saw that in the new CDC guidance as well, where they still ask us to, to, to the extent possible to maintain six feet, but relaxed a little bit and saying if we could layer on the mitigation strategies, which we've uh, proudly and, and um, carefully uh, implemented since day one uh, to make sure they're in place, and I think they've been very effective. Uh, and that since the pandemic began, the rate of positive cases at the secondary level are higher than elementary rates, um, and that still remains true, uh, which supports the caution for maintaining six-foot distance. Uh, and that's going to be the challenge of these groups that are meeting to determine how best to use the space uh, and, and how to fit more students into the building. So we are mitigating risk. You know, our positivity rates are significantly down since December. Uh, the community responded, and uh, as I've said, with the yellow zone for past four weeks. The district is one of the first on the South Shore to provide free COVID testing for all staff, um, and that continues to, to go on today. Um, we are one of the first on the South Shore to provide pool testing for students. Um, we will advocate to the extent possible for more families to participate. Uh, it is voluntary, um, but we, ha we are asking them to please participate if at all possible, um, because we think this is a good mitigation tool uh, to, to keep us safe and, and to uh, ensure that everyone in our buildings is uh, COVID free. Uh, testing initiatives will aid the district in monitoring the, monitoring the prevalence of COVID-19 in our schools and community, and it will allow us to act quickly if there is a case. So again, identifying quickly and being able to respond quickly will make the difference in um, the, the, the ability for us to continue to be an in-person. We have, uh, we have provided all the additional PPE equipment um, right along with air purifiers, daily CO2 checks, any and all PPE um, available that we have for our staff and we continue to make that available to them. We are balancing the risk at once. And again, we need to acknowledge these risks, but you know, again, the, the, the numbers are in our favor. The science is telling us that it's safer to do so. Reducing from six feet to three foot to six foot distances. And again, there's gonna be a range uh, depending on the size of the class. Um, might increase the potential number of children and staff subject to quarantine, entire class quarantine, or perhaps whole school quarantine. We saw some of the things and what um, we really want to look at. We saw some of the guidance out of the CDC that talked about putting children in pods and then separating the pods from one another so that if you did have a positive case, that you would have fewer children within a, within a class have to quarantine. So we will take a look at that structure um, and, uh, and to see if that works for us. Reducing from six feet to three foot six, um, physical distance might increase the risk of transmission. Um, this will need to be monitored, although evidence has shown low risk with multiple mitigation factors are in place. Uh, and again, we have all those. High risk individuals may reconsider their ability to continue in person due to the potential of increased risk of personal or family safety. Um, this could exacerbate our staffing shortage. To date, I have not had any additional people with this um, 
with this proposal on board. Uh, that could change after you know your choice to to either move forward tonight or not. Um, and then providing the unmasked lunches and increased mass breaks um, all at six feet might increase the transmission of COVID-19 in our schools. As I said to an earlier uh, question tonight, we have seen in other communities that have shown no in-school transmission have had lunch at the six-foot distancing all year long. Uh, and so we've seen that it can be done safely uh, and that we, were, we are currently planning that um, process now to ensure the safety of our students at all times. The next steps. So the proposals, um, we said we're subject to collective bargaining. Um, so we are obviously working hard with our association to make all the, um, the commitment to, to bring our students in. It's our intent to collaborate with administration and teachers to support our students uh, as we've done in the collective bargaining. Tonight, we're asking the school committee to take a formal vote of support for this proposal, but understanding that we will do some still, we still have some bargaining to do. We will advocate for greater commitment from both staff and families to voluntarily participate in the COVID-19 testing programs. Um, this is an essential component directly related to the health and safety of our students. Our families will be surveyed as we've done right now. We're in the process this week and we continue to advocate for vaccines for all staff uh, and some members of our staff have already received the vaccine, but getting everyone vaccinated as quickly as possible is absolutely essential. That's it. I will. That's the uh, what we presented last week, and it's the update. And I'll take any questions. Okay, thank you very much, um, and I, I appreciate you changing the review of the secondary level from monthly to weekly. I think that's a, a great step. And I just want to say thank you to the principals for getting their advisory committees up and running quickly, and to the doctors who are volunteering their expertise. I think that's that's going to be really helpful moving forward. Um, I just had one question. It was, there's something that was a little confusing on one of the slides and I've actually received some questions from parents. When you say the K through five going back full-time in person, kindergarten is still saying, staying at the two thirds days, correct? That is correct. We have not uh, adjusted that at all. That's why I said in the, the slide, it's full-time five days with one through five going full days. Okay, great, that's helpful. Okay, does anyone on the, on the committee have any questions or comments about this? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Um, okay, um, all right, We so I see one hand up. Uh, Linda, if you could unmute yourself and give your name and address, please. Oh, hi, this is, sorry, this is Linda Sharkansky. Let me just shut off my phone. Um, 32 Hancock Road. I just, I, I remain concerned about the oldest learners and that they're, there's not a, a call to action and urgency based upon what we talked about tonight. I mean, the indicators seem to be that it's safe to return to school and to keep waiting for additional meetings seems an injustice to these kids. They don't have the time to make up for the educational deficits. They don't have the time to recoup and regroup. I just, there's gotta be a sense of urgency to make this happen, but I do appreciate the, the compelling uh, presentation earlier and the work of the principals, but it, it can't wait. It just can't wait. I don't know why the focus is on our younger, younger students. I just find it um, disturbing. And that's it. Okay. Thank you, Linda, for the feedback. Uh, Lauren Burm. Hi, um, Lauren Burham, Five Pine Grove Road. Just a question, just to, to clarify. Um, so the school committee just say you vote in favor of this tonight. Then it goes back to the Hingham Education Association for more bargaining. So if you guys are planning for an opening, you know, full opening for K through five, the 15th, that's two and a half weeks away. So can you share the schedule for the meetings with the HEA? Um, I think Liza can do that, but I, I will say that they've been working on this for quite a while. It's not like we're starting from scratch now and right. to get this done by the 15th. Yeah. Liza, could you? Yeah, we're meeting with them tomorrow. Um, and we have been talking with them a, about a lot of components. And I think we have some answers of some key things of what we're working on for them tomorrow. So we're, and we're aware of, the dates and the deadlines and everything. And so we're on it. 
Okay, thanks, Liza. Uh, uh, Kajificus, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Thank you. It's Kaya Fickus, two bishops lane. No problem. Sorry. My name is not English. <laughs> so um, this is a detailed question for when elementary goes back full time. Should any children need to quarantine? What is the plan for remote learning for them? Because my understanding is that remote learning at that point will be taught by a different teacher as opposed to the teachers, the in-classroom experience. So how will that work? Dr. Lobilwa, do you want to take that? I sure can. Um, that part. Here's the question. They will um, be receiving packets um, of work to complete at home, similar to as if uh, kids had to be out for a medical procedure or any other issue during a typical school year. And that is really to preserve the, the learning progression of our remote, lear our remote only learners. So again, kids who have to sort of not be in school because of quarantine um, will still have connection with their classroom teacher, but will be provided with, with work packets to complete um, while they're not in school. Thank you. And I'm not seeing any other hands. Um, so um, I believe Liza is going to make a motion. Yes. So I will make a motion to accept and support the proposal of the administration to increase in person learning as outlined in the presentation tonight. I'll second. Thank you, Libby. Okay. Uh, alphabetically, Michelle Ayer. Aye. Jen Benham? Aye. Ms. Quinty? Aye. Carlos De Silva? Aye. Libby Lewicki? Aye. Lato Riley? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. So the motion passes. Uh, 6.2 is to review the fiscal year 2022 proposed operating budget and act as appropriate. Dr. Austin? Thank you, and thank you for that uh, that uh, positive vote. And we have a lot of work to do, but we're on it as well. And uh, we hope to meet that deadline uh, um, and uh, get our students back in. So thank you all for that support. Um, anyway, all right, so um, we've been talking budget now for, uh, it seems like, eons. Uh, and we are coming to a, a time where tomorrow night we'll meet with our collective uh, Board of Selectmen and ADCOM uh, to present the full budget. And uh, so tonight I have uh, a presentation for you that uh, highlights, again, all of the important parts of the budget uh, in a more extensive way. So uh, first, just the guiding principles, these are the things that we said we would do, that the school committee would, uh, in this budget, provide for the expanded Hingham tier system of support uh, necessary to remediate the loss of academic progress resulting from COVID-19. We were going to fund the process and development of five-year Hingham Public Schools strategic plan. We're going to provide staffing and support for special education to ensure that the district is able to appropriately and adequately address the needs of students, staff, and the community. We're gonna fund resources required for year one of the district equity and inclusion plan. And you said that we would provide for needed personnel support for central office administration, which includes the addition of a payroll clerk and administrative assistant to perform data analytics and provide school committee, social media and communication support. So one of the things that I wanna do is we're gonna talk a little bit about current enrollment. So we look at the March, 2020, um, current enrollment on which is the second column, we had 4,319 students. That was what we all agreed to when we decided to build this budget, or we started to build this budget. Our working groups with the Board of Select and Ad Adcom, the forecast group, um, had recommended that we use March 2020 pre COVID. Um, enrollment with the expectation that we would have some students return. If those students do not return, uh, and then there'll have to be some adjustments that'll come a little bit later. Um, but I'm gonna go through this anyway. In February 21 um, or February 1st this year, we had 3,939 students or minus 9% of our overall population. If you look at the top of this, pre-K is one of our largest um, losses in students. We lost about 51% uh, or 37 students. In our K to five population, uh, it was 13% uh, percent, um, where we had uh, decreased quite a bit more than uh, 250 students overall. Um, and then six, eight uh, had a reduction of about uh, 85 or 90 students. 
Uh, and then 912 actually was relatively stable with loss of 12 students overall. Um, so you would really say that's a, a negligible loss of students that remain fairly steady. Um, and so what you're seeing, and, and I think it's, uh, you'll see in the next slides that we point out where the losses are really come from, coming from. So this is just another enrollment history. When we look at the last um, several years in 2017, um, where we've seen 4,300 students, which was our highest number, uh, and that number has um, stayed fairly um, you know, I guess when you're talking about numbers of 4,300 students, a loss of 40 students is 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 one percent, and so that fluctuation is is pretty common uh, in in the last several years. Where this year, um, the number on October one was 3,894, um, and so you know what we say is the the asterisk there is that we have to understand the reduced enrollment could negatively impact state chapter 70 funding, which is exactly what it did do uh, in this coming year uh, because it was on the October 1, 2020 count. Again, this is when we when we uh, we were asked by a lot of people to put out the what is the March 2020 uh, enrollment look like, and you can see in um, in our totals on the left side you see in grades pre K through five um, for um, what it was in March of 2020. At the elementary level, we had um, 18, um, 1,967 students uh, pre-K through um, five, six to eight, we had 1,005, and nine through 12, we had 1,295, which brought our total to 4,191, plus an additional 76 for pre-K. When you compare that to the right, which is our, um, our presumed preliminary projections for FY22, again, on the projections that we all agreed to to, to base the presumptions of this, disc, of this uh, budget, um, we believe it's gonna be estimated total of 4,169 plus 75 uh, pre-K students. And again, if that doesn't come to fruition, they'll be they'll have to be adjustments later on that. So I want to talk a little bit about enrollments notes that prior to the development of FY22, as I've said, the town forecast group agreed to base the budget on our March 2020 enrollment. Grades 9 through 12, enrollment stayed stable with only a 12 student difference in comparison to 2020. Since February 2020, district enrollment has declined by 382 students or 9%. Of those 382, uh, 382 fewer students, students in pre-K pre through grade two account for nearly 60% of that total decline. So in pre-K enrollment dropped 40 students in pre-K, 89 students in kindergarten are nearly 29.2%. First grade as, was not as dramatic as kindergarten and, and pre-K with a 56 student in, uh, de decline at 18.4, and then second grade enrollment declined by 43 students or 13.4. Uh, and once you saw at the, the charts in front of that, that they, the numbers in, uh, as we went third through uh, the rest of the, the school, they were fairly consistent with, um, with slight drops across the board, but certainly not as dramatic as pre-K through um, two. We anticipate that most of our students who are enrolled in FY21 during the pandemic, particularly at the elementary level, will return in FY22. We are hearing that some will not. And again, we will need to have a, a better number that we'll have a better handle on that uh, in the months to come. So at this time, our current elementary class sizes, kindergarten, we have 15 sections. We have 216 students. The average class size for kindergarten is 14.4. That's atypical for us. It's normally around 18 or 19, I think. Um, it's pretty close. Um, first grade, we have 15. We have 249 students, so 16.6. Second grade, another 15 sections with a class size average of 18.2. Third grade has 19.3 on average uh, across the district. Fourth grade has 15 sections as well, uh, with almost 300 students uh, at 19.9. And fifth grade has 16 sections, 318 students for 19.9. And again, this is an average class size. So what we see across the district, and this is true for every grade, you have some schools that have, you could have 20 or 22 in a class, and others that I'd have 14 or 15. And so it doesn't, it's not necessarily I simply just took the number of sections divided by the number of students to come up with the average class size. So the people are aware that you might be, your child might be in a classroom that has more students than that. 
I'm also asked a lot about the class sizes at the high school, and particularly people are interested in those number of classes that are below 15, uh, equal to or below 15, and those classes that are equal to above 25. So at the middle school, we have a total class section of, we have two, 289 total classes uh, or total class sections. Of those 41 or 8.3%, not including the special ed classes, are below um, uh, 15 or, or less. Um, the average class size in those, which includes some special education classes, is 11.2. It's really important to, to note that if you were to look at this chart, you're going to see several special education classes be very, very small, which is designed that way um, for the needs of our students. So it could be three, four, five, six students. Uh, but the average classes, even though it's 11.2 here, when it comes to the, the general ed classes that are below 15, are closer to 13, 14 on average overall. Um, so of the notes of that, on the less than 15, 17 are, of the 41 are special education intervention classes. Several are also overflow classes where they have, or higher level classes. So what you're gonna see on the other side of this is we have 23 classes in the middle school that are above uh, 25, which is a, it's about the same as, it's an equal number of those below 15, about 8%. The average class size is 25.7. So it, in the notes section, we have five grade six social studies uh, sections, four grade six science sections, three grade seven, eight STEM, and five grade six world language sections that are all above uh, 25. Some of those that you see above are also the ones that you see because of the overflow are causing the below 15 because there are too many students to fit into those classes. So that's really an important note. I would say the same is true for the high school where we have 55 classes out of 374 total sections. Um, and that's, that accounts for 12.3, not including uh, special education or intervention classes. The, however, the average class size is slightly higher with 12.3 overall when, of, of those classes below 15. Nine of the 55 are intervention classes based upon student need. Several are due to students opting out of classes that dropped to the class size below 15. So they were higher when they started, but then students either transferred out, went to a different class or dropped the class. Some are AP courses, AP English language, for example, also had an enrollment of 38 overall, which is too large for one class. So one section has 14 and the other has 24. So a lot of these are due on schedules uh, that play a major part uh, in our class size differences. So we try to average them out, but the fact is that we don't, we don't have enough periods in a day to make them all even. Of the classes over 25, we have 47, which accounts for 12.6. And again, it's very similar to the opposite side of below 15. Um, the average class size is 25.4. There are a wide range of classes that have over 25 students. They are English Lit, Mathematics, Physics and Biology, World Languages, Social Studies and Social Sciences. There were no patterns that were, and I, I know I think one of the things you wanna look at when you see classes below 15, there were no patterns of classes that just aren't wanted by students anymore. Most of these things are about overflow or they are have more um, intensive work with smaller levels uh, or smaller groups of students. So overall, the budget that I presented uh, the approved budget in FY21 uh, was 56739985 The actual level services increase, that's to keep things just as they are uh, with the services we need, uh, was another tw uh, 2521166 We've talked often about revenue losses, and I'll, I'll show that again in a moment. Uh, 545, uh, 437 that needs to be made up in the next budget. So the level services budget, just to keep things even as they are now, uh, is 59,796,588 or 5.4%. The FY22 proposed recovery budget adds 2,486,228 for a total proposed FY22 budget of 62,282,816 or 9.79%. This is also a breakdown of um, the way that things get spent in the district. So in the personnel area, which this is the new FY22 proposed budget, 84% of the budget is made out by personnel costs. These are the salary of, our, of all of our staff. Um, and so that makes up for 52,425,406. The contracts, 
um, which are things like electricity, our power, our oil contracts, our busing contracts, some of it could be special education tuition, uh, et cetera, uh, amounts to 13% of the budget or 8,143,112. And the other are technology needs, um, maintenance um, items, you know, the uh, equipment items, et cetera, which is 3% of the budget at 1,909,702. But again, the important number is that almost 85% of our budget is made up of personnel cost, which is a very high number um, and, and is the bulk of our budget overall. So as again, we are uh, the proposed FY22 budget. You've seen this several times. Uh, and there's a couple of things that I wanna point out, the real drivers in the budget um, that we just saw. If you look in the area, the, the red circled areas, um, one is the 2300 line, which is teaching. That's salary of our teachers that we're proposing. Um, that includes the salary of the teachers we have existing, plus the new ones we're adding uh, into the new budget. Um, that drives the budget uh, almost a $3 million increase uh, over last year, uh, which is almost uh, over 11% overall. Another area down in special education, which again, you, you've seen as Dr. Lubilwa pointed out in his presentation, the addition of several special education positions, um, which account for 1,223,185 increase in the budget or almost a 15% overall increase uh, in special education teaching uh, or instruction areas. These are the changes uh, from January 7th. So we track uh, the changes to the budget. Um, and so we had, uh, had not included originally an elementary writing specialist that we had to add in uh, after that date. Um, we actually, on the circuit grader offset, um, we actually had a higher rate come in. So we, instead of the 1.6 we had projected, we actually have a record of 1,796,301 to the positive. We have several teacher retirements um, that are uh, now reflected in the budget. Um, they were not when we started. So these teachers, uh, that 115 or 116 uh, rough uh, salaries, we now have a new rate of uh, projected as 79,378. We, uh, we put those all at a master six level or a master five level, whatever that is, uh, right in that range. So that's how we project the budget. Uh, and that can change up and down or depending on who we are able to find for those positions and higher. We have several teachers who have been on uh, leave of absence. I think there's nine of them there. Uh, and so at this point, those leaves are, are taken by people who are uh, either long, one year positions, long term subs, et cetera. And so with them coming back, that actually adds to the budget. Uh, and so we have to account for that in the budget. Um, and then uh, we have a water rate increase that so we anticipated about 10%, uh, which makes a little bit of difference. We actually increased our athletic revolving fund use. So the use of we had, we had athletic um, revolving funds that we've chosen to use uh, more of a, a portion of. Um, so we added $20,000 to that. And that's the same thing true for the uh, building revolving fund use. We increased that by 50,000 to offset the budget. So a total of 194,404 less that we uh, took away from the budget, which dropped it down from the original 10.13% down to 9.79. So again, we've talked a little bit about the revenue losses. I don't think we need to go through these again, but um, some of the things that we, we have lost revenue from the KIA that didn't operate this year. We had a, redu a reduction in the uh, full day kindergarten revenue. Obviously we didn't have any tuition this year. Um, we had reduced pre-K tuition, uh, as you saw, with more than a 50% reduction in the students. Um, the food service offsets were unavailable due to the, current, um, the COVID losses. Um, we had increases in vo technical, uh, vo vocational technical students. Um, and then we had incremental tech spending on annual software and loss, um, licenses. That was more than uh, we expected. We have now uh, a new five-year big yellow bus contract. Um, so we had to add that to the budget. And the rent for traces uh, for one month of St. Jerome's overlap, uh, as you know, we've, we've talked about the traces program that used to be at the, um, the depot area, uh, has now had to use rented space in Weymouth. Um, so that amounts to so total uh, revenue and non-discretion of 773,833. Um, however, we have adjusted that to, uh, to talk about non-recurring debt. Uh, maybe uh, programs will recover and yield some available offsets. Um, 
these are permanent expense, expenses in the recurrent of 236,395.59. Um, there is some fluctuation that goes up and down. We can count for about 29,000. And then some of them, uh, some of these partial adjusted services of 385, 985 uh, may be permanent uh, long-term. Um, but for the losses from above, it amounts to 545,437. And again, offsets to the proposed budget, we're often asked about the grants, well, how much money do we have on hand when it comes to grants? If you see on the left side, you see the grant that's the IDEA, special education, um, accounts for in the 21-22 budget, we anticipate an $839,054 grant from IDEA. ECC is $13,490. Um, the circuit breaker is $1,796,301. Tuition um, revolving is $220,000. Uh, and then other revolving um, uh, for special education, et cetera, is zero uh, anticipated this year. So not, net spending in special ed overall uh, is 15 million seven hundred one eight twenty seven. And the regular ed spending side, the offsets include athletics, uh, which we've just talked about. If you look to the last column on the right, we use 358,308. Um, we, from middle school activity fund, another 50,000. The field revolving account, we've taken 30,000. The building revolving account, um, $28,000. Um, the kids in action, we anticipate a $53,750 uh, increase to that. Food services, $18,750, all the way down to the cable grant of $18,466, which helps us fund uh, some teachers at the high school. The Medco grant um, for our students that are from Boston, uh, $116,845. And then the uh, full day kindergarten uh, projected uh, enrollment of 225 at this time. But again, it's based on 225. That could go up. Uh, so right now we're, we're looking at 661.015. So the net spending regular education is 46,574,106. The total offsets is 4,204,936. So the total actual school spending budget. So if you add the 62 million that we talked about in the budget plus the offsets, we come up with 66,480,869. So how much does the school system really spend in tuitions, fees, grants, and revolving accounts are added in? And again, if you look at the proposed um, FY22 budget, the operating budget is 66,480,869, which is the number I just gave you that with, including what we would get for town funding, the state funding, and the, and the federal and state grants. Um, in addition to a capital budget of 2,406,838, um, for a total school budget of actually 68,887,707. And again, we, I don't know if we need to go through all the grants again, but the federal grants uh, are in uh, IDEA and then the early childhood grants, state reimbursement grants from Circuit Breaker and Metco, the tuition charges uh, in full day K, pre gay tuition, student fees that we've talked about in athletics and activity bring us uh, over $400,000 and other budget credits such as rental accounts, food services, uh, et cetera, bring us to those offsets of 4,204,936. So in the recovery budget, the purpose of the recovery budget is to provide those supports and services that we believe are necessary to assist our students in recovering uh, the academic and social emotional losses due to the uh, pandemic. The FY22 proposed recovery budget, these are the items in that that we've outlined, are 2,486,228, plus the level services budget of 59,796,588, comes up with our total budget of 62,282,816. So the recovery budget justification, the Hingham students have already missed 11 months of regular school attendance. We have been able to document that the loss of in-person instructional time has negatively and significantly impacted the academic and social and emotional function of our children. The bulk of the recovery items is directed toward intervention services, which were well documented need prior to COVID-19. There has been a documented history of achievement gaps between all students students with disabilities and high needs students. And the educational disruption caused by COVID-19 has exacerbated these achievement gaps, which we saw in Dr. Ladoa's report earlier. When comparing current reading performance data, the average performance data of same age students from the previous 10 years, all grades K through five, earned statistically significant lower scores. 
as we analyze their lower performance is statistically significant, we have a very high level of confidence, over 95%, that the lower performance did not occur by chance alone. We anticipate that even with the intervention services in this budget, this gap in achievement could take several years to, quote unquote, make up. Um, I think to, to some of the points made earlier, this is not gonna be a one year fix. It's gonna take many years to, to help our students. While it is notable that total grade performance is lower, those group of children who have historically struggled have experienced an even greater level of performance deficit. Thus, intervention services for these children will need to be absolutely intensified. Because the district does not have formal math intervention system as proposed in the current budget, we have no district-wide skill assessment data beyond the MCAS and some of the things that they discussed earlier. This will be rectified with the current budget request. Although the district does not have the skill-based assessment data for math that exists for reading, we do believe that based upon the lack of intervention services available, as well as the increased referrals for intervention, the performance data deficits we find in reading follow suit in math, and we've shown that earlier. Middle school grade analysis, overall reduction of A's and B's. You heard the increase in C's, D's, and F's in the core academic areas. And the high school uh, analysis, overall reduction in B's, C's, and D's, although there is an increase of A's that I think uh, do deserve some uh, attention as to why, as well as an increase in the number of F's, uh, which are 85. The district saw an increase of 3% from 14 to 17% in students requiring math support in grade six. In regards to social emotional functioning, current high school uh, middle school students are evidencing higher levels in both high risk and some risk on all areas measured by the strengths and difficulties questionnaire, the SDQ, total difficulties, emotional problems, conduct problems, hyperactivity and attention, and peer problems. In comparison to the 2018-19 high school, ninth graders reported that they are evidencing higher risk and total difficulties hyperactivity and attention, peer problems, and pro-social skills. The number of students found eligible for education, special education so far this year has increased by 46% over last year. The recovery uh, budget includes level services budget plus the addition of the academic and social emotional supports and services for our students. This includes two contracted adjustment counselors shared amongst the four schools at the elementary level, one literacy specialist for each school, one math tutor, um, four total for each elementary, one math paraeducator, and one district-wide elementary writing specialist that will be shared. For special education, it's one special ed administrator, one special ed administrator, the second, four special education, three special speech and therapists. At the middle school, it's an additional literacy specialist, a math specialist, two math teachers, and one additional STEM teacher. At the high school, it actually increases by one guidance counselor, and then adds some fit, um, partial FTEs to a uh, half-time directed study teacher, 0.25 English, 0.5 Health, 0.6 Math, and 1.2 World Languages teachers. District-wide support for the recovery budget is one data analysis communication administrative assistant, the William James uh, College Interface Referral System that Dr. Lodola talked about earlier, district-wide math intervention program, and strategic planning and equity planning. So all these things, this is just another view of what each of these costs. I will say we get a lot of questions about what's non-reoccurring, non things that we don't think we'll see again in the next budget. And of those, we believe that the strategic planning that we've asked for for $50,000, the equity planning for 25, the summer programs for special education, uh, and the elementary adjustment counselors on contract uh, make up uh, appro approximately $392,000 of the overall 2.4 requested. All of the other positions uh, and services we would assume are going to be recurring for at least a few years down the road, if not permanently. And this is just another view of that. Again, we'll post all of this online for you tonight or tomorrow morning. Uh, and this just um, points out the cost for each of the positions that we have in the budget. So how does funding impact HPS? We have a lot of questions asked about per, per pupil costs, uh, and I'll try to explain that. Uh, Hingham Public Schools is historically operated with great efficiency. In collaboration with the town of Hingham, we have kept our pure pupil costs significantly lower than both state 
uh, and uh, benchmark community averages. The per pupil cost included all expenditures except community services, fixed assets, and debt services. The per pupil costs are a compilation of the total cost of education for each town in the Commonwealth. Hingham's 2019-2020 per pupil cost, I apologize, it's getting late, folks, I'm a little tongue tied. Um, according to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, was 14,906 per student. However, I would caution these results should be reviewed uh, with caution as there are differences in the way that towns allocate charges to schools in their town. For example, for DPW, we don't pay for plowing or, or maintaining our uh, grass and, and doing all those kind of things. Um, those other districts might have those in their budgets. So that, that I just wanted to make sure that people understand, not always them. Then the best on the average of the, the average manager of all bench, 1,800. 89 per student in 2019-2020. Hingham ranks 20th out of 21 for the lowest spending per student uh, in regards to our um, uh, benchmark communities. And the average per pupil expansion in the Commonwealth for 2019-2020 was 17,149 in comparison to our 14,906. This is a chart of this. This comes actually from the um, DESE website. Um, so it shows you Overall, where Hingham is, Hingham is on the right, uh, I mean the red uh, on this chart. Um, the yellow is actually the benchmark average of all of our communities. And you can see that we only have one community for total in district, uh, in district expenditures. Those are students that are not out of district placements, et cetera, uh, for tuition. Uh, so that's our, our 14,029 uh, uh, in 2019-2020. Uh, um, and then if you look at total expenditures overall, uh, again, we are 20th out of 21 uh, overall with only when Chester uh, spending at a lower rate. <clears throat> Why can't we redeploy staff to provide the intervention services we need? So another question we have is if we're funded if we're funding adequately, why can't we just move people around? Well, the simple answer is that we don't have enough staff to redeploy. Doing so would substantially increase our traditionally high student to staff ratios. Prior to COVID-19, Hingham students to teacher ratio was 14.2. The average of the 21 benchmark communities is 12.5. So in comparison to our benchmark communities, we rank second highest of 21, with only Milton being higher, just slightly higher with 14.3. Despite our higher salaries, which people like to point those out, obviously, our, pupil spend, our per pupil spending on teachers is ranked 14th out of 21 benchmark communities. In short, we pay our teacher better wages, but we have fewer of them in comparison to our benchmark communities. So we don't have them available to redeploy to provide the staff intervention we need. So again, this is a chart of the student teacher ratio. So now we're on the other side of the of the optics where we're the highest amongst our benchmark communities, ranking number two for the highest student to staff ratio with the average being 12.5. If you look to the, just to the left of the, the yellow marking, that's the state average, which is 12.6. So we're substantially above all of those. The per pupil expenditure for teachers, uh, and now we're down on the other end of things. We are slightly above the state average. The state average on teachers is 6,485. We're slightly above that, but we're below our, our benchmark communities by uh, $467 uh, overall. So how will we know that we have enough intervention? So we've heard that today. We've heard questions about that. If the budget is funded, HPS will implement a much needed intervention program in ELA and math. Um, these programs will provide an ability to regularly assess the needs and academic growth of our students. Results uh, will assist in the prescription of needed interventions. Interventions will be evidence scientifically based and growth will be measured often to effectiveness intervention individually and as a whole. How long will these services be needed and enough space for all of these? As we've clearly shown, HPS has been in need of a robust and evidence scientific intervention program for many years. The pandemic has exacerbated gaps. It's critical to implement these as soon as possible.
anticipate that these intervention services will be refer recurring for years to come. However, adjustments may be made based upon the needs of our students. So if it's not enough, we may have to add. Um, schools were never intended to accommodate um, individual office spaces. We know that they're not built that way. Um, we are proposing a much needed space study uh, at the very current time uh, to determine how best to utilize our space in every regard. Class sizes are high as reported and space is absolutely at a premium. New positions will have to travel and share space as many existing services already do. We will make the room. Our, our principals are amazing. They will do a great job of ensuring that we have space for everyone. So the FY22 budget doesn't fund everything. We've heard some of those questions tonight. The district does not have a fine arts director, which is number one on the list. And we need one to provide leadership and direction for our finance part fine arts program. The district needs to be in compliance with state and DESE requirements for this role. Um, at the current time, we are not. The district is in need of additional technology staff to manage the technology needs of both students and staff. The technology budget needs to be moved from the capital budget to the operation budgets. Uh, it has not grown for quite some time at a, at a reasonable rate, um, which we saw as a real problem at the beginning of the pandemic. HHS is in need of an additional administrator as shown uh, in the FY21 budget. Additional office support is needed as well. Although the district saw a 9% reduction in enrollment overall, the high school enrollment remains steady uh, and that has grown actually and is at the one of the highest rates in the last uh, two decades. Central office is understaffed and is in need of additional position to ensure efficient and effective management of a district the size of Hingham. Textbooks have been level funded for the past two years, which has put us behind on some of our textbook purchases. Full day kindergarten should be considered to be publicly funded uh, to ensure equity for all uh, in Hingham. And integrated preschool publicly funded, um, hopefully by lottery, are things that all need to be in the budget. So our per pupil expenditure, as we just said on instructional materials, which is the equipment and the technology um, and textbooks, Hingham is uh, among 20th out of 21 in spending, well below the average. Our spending is 173 per pupil versus $408 overall uh, in the average. So the path forward. The administration understands the proposed budget is substantial. However, we have shown that COVID-19 has resulted in a negative impact on our students, both academically and emotionally. Despite the financial burden, burden of this proposed budget, we believe it is our ethical duty to put forth a budget that addresses the most immediate and pressing needs of our students. The proposed FY22 budget includes funding for strategic planning that is much needed to guide the district for the next five years. This process will be critical to ensure that the district is meeting the needs of its students in preparation for the future, accommodates the needs of the community, and provides a clear and manageable financial path forward. The proposed FY22 budget includes funding to ensure that the services provided by the district are equitable, equitable and that every student finds growth, enjoyment, success, and confidence in their Hingham Public School education. I want to thank you for your consideration. Thank you for the very late hour and listening to my presentation. Uh, and I thank you most of all for the support of our public schools. Thank you very much, Dr. Austin, for that presentation. It's, I think that, especially in combination with the presentation earlier tonight, really highlights how necessary this conversation is to have now. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll have I'd love to talk to the committee about your thoughts. What I was thinking about it is, so we had a, when we had our last meeting with ACES, um, the Education Subcommittee of ADCOM, we talked about whether we would vote on this tonight. Um, after uh, having some discussions and doing a little research, I guess the school committee doesn't typically vote on the budget. It, it, we vote on the budget right before town meeting, the official vote. And I think this year, especially because we don't have um, much of a view as far as what kind of federal funds might be coming in or from the state. We want to um, keep it open. Um, and I'm hoping that the federal government and maybe the state government will really step up. Um, but so, but I do think it's important since we are going into the education budget hearing tomorrow with the Board of Selectmen that we go in um, united, that this is, we're supporting this as the body that's been charged with kicking the tires and for the school budget and, um, and really um, digging into it and figuring out what we need um, so I put a letter in your in your packets. If you, I don't know if you had time to see to read it, um, 
And I, so I'd love your thoughts on that too, as well as the budget proposal. Um, and I'm really looking, I'm not looking for wordsmithing so much as just anything content. Does it say what we want it to say as a committee? So with all that said, does anyone have any questions? Liza? Um, yeah, so thank you, Paul, hearing the presentation a couple, and then the earlier presentation pointed a couple things out. And then Carrie, on your letter, that you, your statement you drafted, one of the things that st struck me is the statement about that the forecast group agreed on two things. One, that we were to assume enrollment remain at the pre-pandemic level of March, 2020. Mm -hmm. And second, that the proposed budget should provide the essential services required to enable our students to recover from the severe educational disruption caused by COVID-19. Right. So I would like, as hearing this presentation, Paul, I would like you in your slide about recovery budget justification to include that line that the forecast group agreed that the budget should cover this. Um, because you mentioned earlier in the presentation that the forecast group agreed on the enrollment number we should be working with. Mm -hmm. So I really think that should be emphasized in the presentation. Um, and then also I thought tonight that um, the special education statistics in particular should be included in this presentation. I think there was one mention of the 46% increase, but showing that the 79% increase, you know, in the past with budgets, there's always been discussion about we're going to hold special ed budgets harmless in a sense, and that the advisory committee, the board of selectmen would give us that money. But those numbers tonight were really striking that this is in the best interest of the town to invest in this recovery money because otherwise your special ed funds that you've always held us harmless for are just going to just keep increasing. So it's counterproductive. So I think if we got those statistics in there, um, and then also in your recovery budget justification, the first bullet about the math intervention systems, I would take out your first word because um, and just say, we don't have these math intervention systems, period. Um, because I think the phrase was, because we don't have these, we can't have the data. But we just don't have the intervention systems, period. Um, so, and then it, it also relates to the data, but we need those um, things. Oh, and then the other thing on, on the recovery budget where you list the special ed directors, if you can asterisk that as this is another DESC requirement because of the size of our district. Because I don't know if they ever realize, you know, these are real mandates. We, we, these are things we have to do. Um, so I think, uh, and then I think in Carrie, in your, um, statement, I sent you some comments, mm -hmm. but I do think we should emphasize when we're talking about the budget that it's the FY 22 budget and recovery funds. Um, because it, if they committed to providing us recovery funds, we really need to emphasize that it's there. So um, I guess, so that's where I am. I think the, the presentation is thorough. I, I would hope that they watched what Jamie presented tonight because it's extremely compelling. And I think it really complements, you need to see that to understand this budget. So I don't know if we send them the clip of the video or send them the presentation to go along with this. Um, we'll certainly do that. I really think they need to hear it and see it and, you know, take a deep breath and realize if they're not voting for this budget, 
that's what they're voting against. And it's really sad. So we gotta go in there strong tomorrow. So that's all I had. Thank you, Liza. Carlos? And I think also just to pick back on what Liza said is if I heard loud and clear from the advisory, um, they say, you know, to the asking, right? And I know that this budget is not funding uh, the director of finance and also the uh, assistant principal at the high school. Um, I'm not sure if we have costed that out, uh, how much would that cost to hire those two, for those two positions. But I would respectfully ask that, you know, perhaps we consider adding them here for the heck of it. Thank you. So, Carlos, just to those, I agree we need those positions, and I would include a director of equity and inclusion in there, too. Um, I think I, I worry about including something for the heck of it, because we did agree with the town that we would present a, a budget that we needed for our children to recover um, from COVID. So I, I don't think we should, I mean, I think there are important positions, but I, it, it would worry me to do that without having some thoughtful analysis behind it um, to, before we put it in there. Um, I don't know what other people's thoughts are on that though. Ness? I, yeah, I, I mean, I agree with Carlos, I, especially given the fine arts director, especially is a requirement. Um, we know we need it. Uh, and we have, we've got this great athletics department, one that we're so proud of, but we don't have an equivalent fine arts department. And there are kids who are wanting to go into those kinds of fields that don't have the opportunity because we don't have somebody who's kind of directing them and leading them. They have class um, issues and they don't have anybody to to be there to, to support them. And, you know, I think we, the kids are in school for 13 years and we're messing around. The adults in the room are messing around with the budget for three to five years. And that's a significant portion of their school years. They're losing out on this time. And I, and I think it's just, we keep banging our heads against the, the the wall. We keep saying we need it, and they're losing this time. They, there are kids who want to take classes and they can't take classes. They might have kids who want to go into the arts who've missed that opportunity. We're pigeonho pigeonholing them into maybe a profession that they don't want to be in because they didn't have the opportunity to expand um, what they might have been able to do. So it's it's frustrating. Um, and the, the DEI, I mean, I think we have, I, I, I do believe we need to do more of our equity work, but this is one that I am very strong about that needs to happen next year. We have kids in our district who don't feel safe and that's not okay. Uh, you know, the basic tenant to kids being able to learn is being safe first and they can't they can't learn if they're not feeling safe to begin with. So, um, you know, the, the fine arts one is one that I would really struggle with not putting in this year because we know we need it. We've, we've known we've needed it for, for years. Um, and, you know, going forward, I don't think we have enough counselors and we need the vice principal and, you know, there's a whole list and I appreciate the list, uh, Dr. Austin, that you put in this um, at the end of the budget presentation, the partial list, because I think that captures a really good part of it. Um, so it's my two cents. Great. Thanks, Ness. Does anyone else have any thoughts? Libby? Yeah, I would like to advocate for the fine arts director. And if we, if we can agree to include that in the budget, then I'd like to see an explanation as to why we're not including it. I mean, your letter that you wrote says we're not including it. But it doesn't say why not. And um, I, I am, I, there was a very fine analysis done in presentation last year by one of the teachers. And I'm sorry, I'm not remembering who did it. Um, that was very convincing about how a fine arts director could help to 
um, pull all of those programs together and really help the students with their creative intelligence. And that's going to help with their social emotional learning. So um, I, I think that that's an important piece that I would like to, to see added. And if not, then we really have to understand why we're not including it. Okay, Michelle, did you have something? Yeah, um, sort of. Um, I mean, I think we all, I mean, no one on this call, or at least on this committee or the administration is opposed to filling all the positions, right? I think the, right. the trouble is um, that we can't, we just, we just, the town does not have the resources to fund it all. And what we were asked to put forth was a budget that um, assumed flat enrollment and gave us, enabled the students to recover from all they lost this year. And so I think it's, I, I, it's, it's a strong word to use, but it is, it is not an easy thing for an administrative leadership team, particularly one being headed by someone who's not even been here for 18 months yet, to put a budget forth that is this large, even in a pandemic, um, particularly when we see that there's a big gaping deficit at the bottom of this. So I think that the, the, the reason that it's not in it is, I mean, I think it does say it in here, right? It doesn't meet, we, it, this, this does not meet all the needs. There are many positions that we weren't able to include in this budget. And I think it was for two reasons. I think one, that there's the economic piece of it, unfortunately, but it is a reality. But I think the second piece is, and, and we say it earlier and you know, our ADCOM ACES subcommittee said it as well, that we have to put faith and trust into the people who built this budget. And if they don't think they're ready for those positions yet, then I would take them that they're the educational experts. And if they don't think we're ready to absorb those for whatever that reason may be, then I would say I will, I will defer to their judgment. Yeah, I was kind of thinking along the same same lines. I mean, I, I, I was a professional violist for a while. <laughs> like, I, I understand how important that. I mean, it got it got me through high school, and and so I understand from that perspective how important this is. And but I want these positions to be successful when we finally get them. And I worry that not, you know, just saying we need an arts director. What well, what is that and why? What do we want the department to look look like? Um, and how are we going to measure that? And I think by funding the strategic plan, that's, that puts us on the path to funding all of these positions uh, along the way, but to do it in a way that everyone can have confidence that it will be sustainable and, and keep growing the departments and the programs um, and that they'll be effective. So that's sort of what I was thinking, in addition to the fact that we were asked to put forth a recovery budget, not a... Um, not everything the district needs, because this clearly does not cover everything the district needs. Does so, anyone else? Carrie, yeah. Carrie, could you, um, could you tie into your letter some of what you just said about the strategic plan and, and spell out that, you know, okay, we're not asking them for now, but we will be asking them for them in the very near future. It's, it's, yeah, absolutely, and yeah, I can make that I can make that clearer. Um. Can I interject something, Carrie, real yeah, quick? Sure. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I would think about, you know, there are a lot of things in this budget, and that was just a partial list of the things we need. You know, and I and I think that we we want to be really thoughtful about how we approach the future with that, and that strategic plan becomes so incredibly important. One, because of the financial piece of it. We've got to figure a way forward to be able to do these things over time so that we're not just talking about them or piecemealing them into a budget, but we're actually adding them there. Um, and there's never been in any district I've ever worked in in my history of, of 30 plus years that has exponential amount of uh, or, or, or resources that we can grab onto. We only have so many. 
Um, and a almost 10% budget is a huge budget um, that makes me sweat at night, to be honest, uh, as, I, as I think about that. But I am confident in one thing, that what we put in that budget was what we said we were going to do, which was address the needs of our students, the immediate needs of the losses they have from COVID-19. I am confident in that. I'm also confident that we have to find a way forward to those other positions that are incredibly important. What Michelle said is very, very true. We don't disagree that we need a fine arts director. I would, I would tell you that's one of my first priorities. I told you that last year was one of my first priorities. An equity inclusion director is also another position. An assistant principal. There are many things that need to go into this budget that we have to re really try to find a way forward to try to figure out what the financial picture is, not just this year and getting a one-time, whatever it is, expansion to the budget, but a multi-year way for us to be able to add these things to the budget long-term. And I think that's where the strategic plan comes in. Um, but I, I just wanted to kind of add that I'm really, you know, it's, it's the, the, our focus this year really was on the compelling evidence that we knew existed before Jamie gave us the report that just confirmed everything we really already knew and what we were witnessing firsthand. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other, oh, Jen. Is it working? Yep. Okay, thanks. Um, no, I just want to kind of piggyback on what um, Dr. Austin just said. I mean, I, I there's nothing I would like to, you know, to see more. And I'm supportive of a fine arts director and equity director. And um, but I would defer to what the administration is saying is, is critical and that we was critical and what we have enabled what we need to put forth for are these students to recover. And that's what we said we would do. And, um, but it's still, you know, in the back of my mind for next year. Um, I mean, it, and I agree with Nez, like these, our students do need it. And you're right. These are, these kids are only here for 13 years. Um, and I, I really hope that we can put something in that document that you know strongly supports that we this is you know this is on our mind this is what we're looking for for the future okay thank you um so just am i hearing all right so how does everyone feel about um taking that letter with liza's suggestion to add the language and recovery funds to it and then Libby's suggestion to make it clear that the strategic strategic plan is a path forward to some of these conditions. Is everyone okay with delivering that message to um, the Board of Selectmen tomorrow night? Um, I'll take a motion if anyone wants to make one. I'll do my motion. Go ahead, uh, Michelle. Who we'll just talk? I'd be glad to make a motion to um, support the budget as presented by Dr. Austin uh, to be uh, presented to the Board of uh, Select Me and Headcom uh, tomorrow night. Thank you, Carlos. Do a second? I'll second. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, roll call, Michelle Ayer. Aye. Jen Benham. Aye. Ness Parenti. Aye. Carlos De Silva. Aye. Libby Lewicki. Aye. Liza O'Reilly. Aye. Uh, and I'm an aye as well. Um, it's it's getting very late, and we have we have another uh, we have more to get to tonight, and then we have an executive session after this. So I see some hands up, and I would just ask you to. Um, come to the Board of Selectmen meeting tomorrow night. Uh, it'll be earlier on the agenda um, and we, we can um, discuss things more then. Um, but thank you for, for staying and listening and, um, and for your engagement. Okay, um, number 7.1 is to hear a proposal for a resource dog at Hingham High School and act as appropriate. Thank you, and, and again, thank you for, for hanging in there for so long. And uh, I'm going to turn this over to Rick Swanson really quickly. Um, but um, the issue of a or the 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 
question of a resource dog has been on the plate for about a year now. I think we were talking about this last year, if I recall, Rick, um, and thinking about the potential. And uh, I know you've done a lot of work on that. So I'm going to turn this over to you quickly and allow you to have the floor and, and make your proposal. Sure. And, and I'll do my best to keep it brief. Thank you, Dr. Austin. And um, I, uh, I hope that, that this will actually provide a, a nice contrast in terms of simplicity to the rest of our agenda tonight and hopefully provide a, a feel-good way to come close to, to the end of the meeting. The subject of a resource dog, um, known by various terms, actually, uh, therapy dog, support dog, um, a resource dog for, for a school, has actually been kicking around uh, for a number of years. Uh, our adjustment counselors in particular have been strong advocates of the potential benefits of bringing a dog into the school. And uh, the idea has gained more traction in the last couple of months for, for a number of reasons, uh, one of which was a very generous gift from the class of 2020, uh, who has pledged uh, $10,000 for the purchase of a trained resource dog. Um, and also the willingness of our school resource officer, Tom Ford, uh, to act as the dog's handler. And um, so we're, we're very hopeful about the potential benefits that this could bring to the school in, in a whole variety of ways. Uh, most especially the impact social emotionally uh, for a dog that could be available uh, in our counseling office and for students who, who are in crisis, but also a dog that, that could be available at the school at, at any number of times, uh, greeting students as they come into the building, maybe attending events, maybe showing up at a physics class where students are stressed walking into a final exam, uh, or any number of ways that, that it could add an element of, uh, of family to the school and, uh, and really be a positive thing for the school's culture and climate. So um, we have a couple of other experts who are in the meeting. I'm not sure to what extent school committee would be interested in, in hearing from, from any of them. Uh, obviously it's a late hour, but, but we, we have one person here too from uh, Golden Opportunities, an organization in Walpole that's worked with a number of other schools where we've, we've seen and been further convinced by the, the potential positive impact of this uh, on a school. And even close to home in Weymouth, Hanover, and Marshfield, there have been some really successful programs that we've looked to as models. And uh, we're hopeful to see some of the same benefits here in Hingham. Uh, so happy to, to answer any questions, or we could potentially also draw on some of the other uh, folks who have stuck around uh, for all of this meeting. I'm very grateful uh, to Officer Ford, who's been here the whole time, uh, to somebody from Golden Opportunities, to also to our animal control officer in town who's done some research for us in terms of providing um, low cost veterinary care. And we, we think that this is something that we could do without asking for any funding from the school. It could be funded completely privately and, uh, and, and bring enormous impact. And maybe even as early as next year, uh, if the school committee agrees that this would be a positive thing for our high school. Yeah, that was that was my first question. And actually, it was the funding coming off of our budget conversation. And I was saying I, I really appreciated Appendix A to your letter. And I was thinking maybe Dr. Austin should add some pictures of golden retriever puppies to our budget <laughs> presentation tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that would help. Um, does anyone on the committee have any questions or comments on this? Ness? I think that, sorry, Ness. Ness. I think this would be. Oh, and Carlos, sorry. And Carlos, Ness. Um, I think it's, I think it's great, um, to have this opportunity. Sorry, Ness, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, when I think about, you know, the uses of therapy dog, I, I think it's great for the social, emotional, mental health aspects. Um, you know, I, I think the typical mission of a resource dog is to improve the moods, you know, everything that you said, it's great. Um, but when I think about those roles, I think of um, a social worker or a counselor filling that role as far as the handler goes and not necessarily a um, SRO, a school resource officer. So that was the only comment that I had. Okay, our, I, our thinking uh, was actually that, that um, Officer Ford's role, would, which I would argue really transcends the traditional role of a school resource officer as, as someone who's been part of our community for close to a decade now and, and who also teaches a course and advises several clubs uh, and is really an important, uh, very significant, important contributor to, this, to the school as a whole and also has uh, a very high degree of flexibility in his schedule during the day 
um, unlike almost anyone else in the building, he would have the capacity to bring the dog almost anywhere at any time during the course of the day. Um, and, and his willingness to, to play that role, I think is, uh, is a unique asset. Um, and we also have a good model in, in, in Weymouth, the, the school closest to us that's had a successful program for the past couple of years. Uh, it's the SRO who's been the handler there. And I think gives us a, a good example of how that, that can really can work very well. Thank you. Carlos, did you have something? Yeah, I um, read I read the, the 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 policy proposed policy. The I know it's going to be reviewed by our policy uh, subcommittee. But one thing I would uh, recommend is that instead of having just one handler, that perhaps we consider having two. You know, Officer Ford could win uh, the lottery tomorrow, you know, and take off. Um, and I know we are putting mechanism in place that you know a person would stay you know five years or more with a dog, but uh, perhaps we want to consider having a second person. Perhaps the principal, with his charisma, you know, that would be a great thing. Just a suggestion. If, if my daughter were still awake right now, Carlos, she she would be uh, a great fan of what you just said. <laughs> recommending that the principal play a role here as well. Um, I, I'm not sure, you know, to what extent a, a, a second official handler can, um, is something that can be done. Um, we may be able to ask that question of, um, of the organization we've worked with, but I, I, I do know from uh, having talked to them and, and, and with Tom and looking at some of the other programs as well, that there would at least be the possibility of the, the dog you know, being able to go into an adjustment counselor's office and, and be there with, with Tom outside so that he wouldn't necessarily have to be with the dog in the same room at the same time. Um, but I know I'd, I'd certainly be very eager to, to spend some time with, with that dog myself. And for those of you who have seen the proposal and saw the appendix that included uh, two incredibly cute photos of uh, a golden retriever that, that actually could potentially be if we if we're able to move forward with this and we're lucky enough to, to secure a resource, resource dog for our school, um, there's actually I think a 16 week old golden retriever puppy in Walpole right now that that could potentially be headed our way, and uh, and I understand too that this dog's older sibling is currently acting as a resource dog uh, at Babson University and and earning great reviews there uh, as well. Great, thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Um, thanks. I, that it's so adorable, Appendix A, um, and I am all fully supportive as well. Um, I think it is a, um, I think it would be a great thing for the schools, for the students. Um, I would also though like to echo, I, if, and obviously, you know, who the handler is, is outside the purview of the school committee, but I would just be interested if maybe um, there could be some you know, some conversations maybe with the Hanover, Marshfield, Weymouth, find out who they use for their handler, because I do, and I have the utmost, uh, utmost respect for um, Officer Ford. He helped both of my boys many a time, including getting one of them into an ambulance when he broke his ankle on the first day of high school gym class. Um, I do, I, I just worry though, you know, I, I'm not, you know, I just sort of a uniformed police officer in the school with a dog just, um, you know, just feels a little different than what I think what I would expect for a comfort animal. So just a thought just to maybe see what some of those other schools what they use for um for the handlers. Liza. Yeah, I would uh, agree with all that Michelle said and and Carlos that when I've seen therapy dogs in, in, in educational environments. They're more with the wellness center and with the counselors as Ness said. And so I, I think we should really think about what are the opportunities um, of the dog being seen with those people primarily as, as well as Officer Ford um, because everyone has different experiences with police officers and a dog together. Um, and the intent is for comfort and 
I know our police force that goes the extra mile to have community relations and be kind and everyone wants to trust all the police officers and have a relationship with them and everything. Um, but the intent of a therapy dog is a different situation than you would necessarily think of for a police officer. So it, we can investigate it all. Um, and I think it'd be very popular. Um, and I think it would bring tremendous value to the school. Um, and maybe it's a new mascot for the school. <laughs> Appendix A, I like that name. <laughs> um, but I, I think let's think it through a little bit more and do a little more research and figure it out. Um, right, I appreciate the feedback. And, uh, and, and I would probably agree that at first glance, you know, many people may perhaps not associate a comfort dog with a police officer, but maybe not now. Maybe that, that is potentially something that, that we change and we envision a future where it seems perfectly normal for a comfort dog to, to be with a, a school resource officer, in particular someone who, who has established himself as, as such a vital part of, of the community to this point. It, it is a, a very big ask of whoever would be the handler. There, there are uh, countless, I guess we could provide a number to it. I'm not sure what it is, but it seems countless trips to and from Walpole for training. Uh, it's, it's for the dog uh, training for the handler uh, and, and a willingness to, to bring the dog home each and every day, feed the dog uh, and, and, and be with it. So it's, it would be a, a very significant sacrifice for the person who's willing to do it. And uh, at this point, I feel very grateful uh, to Officer Ford for his stated willingness to, to be part of that. Um, but, uh, you know, understand the, the feedback here as well. Uh, Mr. Question. It says, it looks like go by dog or something. And you said there was a representative from Golden Opportunity here. Is that that person? If you look at Yes. Back. Yeah. It's, it's a very patient person who's, I think, been here since seven o'clock tonight. So it's been, <laughs> has spent four hours with, uh, with all of us. Yeah, so I, I, they, I, they'd like to weigh in and, and want to raise their hand. Uh, no, they did. They did. Oh, so, they did. Good. Yeah. So maybe it might be helpful for the community to hear from the person from Golden Opportunities. Julie, if you could unmute them. Hey, Carrie, it says that that person has an older version of Zoom, so they can't be allowed to talk. But if I promote them, they'll be able to. So I'm going to promote them. You've been promoting them? That'd be great. OK. I've been promoted. <laughs> Hello, all. I know it's been a long night for you. Um, I can just answer a few of those quick questions that you have. Definitely, I agree that having a police officer be a therapeutic social worker kind of person, that's not what they do. They do not provide any kind of therapy or social work, but they do help in de-escalation. Um, I've been an emergency room nurse and I've seen children come in and it's the last thing in the whole world that you want to see your children to go through. So our dogs have saved countless amounts of trips to the emergency room just because they're able to be de-escalated um, at the scene. Having these dogs, we have them in eight towns surrounding the Walpole area and each town has said it's been a huge success. The comments from the children are, it's the best thing that this school has ever done. Um, they definitely overlook the fact that the handler behind the dog is an officer, but also, you know, we do need to give some credit to a police officer that's willing to put himself out there and, you know, kind of make a little change in police reform. So um, given that they're not there to provide counseling, they are not there to provide therapeutic visits, anything like that, but their job is huge and very instrumental in preventing hospital visits for de-escalating students for actually a few of your comments just this evening was with all of your social emotional um, needs. One that was very in particular, low morale <clears throat> um, can lead to low student achievement. This boosts student morale more than you will ever imagine. Yes, it's a mascot. Yes, it's a therapeutic sit down. They work wonders for bereavement um time in um we've done so many really great things with these dogs that um 
I would hope that you could just try and be open to the benefits that it does provide and know that they're not coming in as a, um, as a counselor or a social worker. And if you had the finances to do that, you would have one. And I'm sure you do have one, but this is again, something that's provided to you for free. It's through the police department that's funding it. And um, it's really great thing. Very, very, very beneficial to the, um, to the town, to the morale, to learning, to decreasing fear on test days, decreasing stress on the first day of school, day before, uh, the day of finals. I, the list goes on with the benefits with one of these dogs. Great, thank you. That's helpful. Absolutely. Libby, did you have something, Libby? I do. So you said he's a 14 week old puppy. Uh, how, how how much time do we have to decide before that puppy goes still? Um, <laughs> um, it's definitely a dog that could be going elsewhere. So I would like to have it be done sooner than later. Um, as we said, the police department's already done a lot of legwork and a lot of work to get to this point. I mean, a couple of weeks, a month um, is a potential. <clears throat> what are you thinking? I I'm thinking the sooner the better, but I, I you know, I, I, and I, I'm just it, it seems like a great idea. I'm, I'm a yes. I don't need to talk about it, but um, it just, uh, you know, there's questions from other school committee members that need to be addressed. Then I'm, I, I don't want to drag it on, and, you know, to the point where we lose the opportunity to get the puppy. So right. We're on thinking. I think anything we can do to support students, the social emotional health during this time, um, is I'm all for I'm all for it. Um, I, I understand I had the same reaction that Ness and Michelle did um, as far as the handler piece. And I, I mean, I think we can we can talk about that. It isn't our purview. So we just wanted to, we, what we would do is work on the policies surrounding it and what we want the program to look like. And we can do that through the policy subcommittee. Um, I think, and then uh, it sounds like this would not cut, take anything from our budget either. Um, which is important because there are some critical needs there. So it sounds like it, the class of 2020 did the lion's share of fundraising for it and um, some more private fundraising could happen. So I don't know, I'm, I'm all for it too. Um, and I think we, you need us to reach consensus tonight, right? And then the policy subcommittee can go to work on the policies. Is that correct? I think what I'd be liking, you, uh, what I'd be liking, not sorry, that didn't make any sense. Uh, what I would like you to do is reach consensus that we could move forward. Um, it doesn't take the formal, but that would allow, because I've also asked Rick to work on making sure that we've uh, secured funding uh, for the first year. And for him to do that, he really needs to believe that you've got support of that. Um, there are some questions that we need to ask and then we can work, I'll work with him uh, and his team to be able to do that. Uh, and then I think we could come back to you in a couple of weeks with an update on, on where we're at with it. That's so I would appreciate a consensus uh, from the school committee. Great. Um, let's see, Leslie Badger with her hand up. Let me unmute her. What was that? I'm sorry, I didn't. Sorry, Leslie Badger, she's the animal controller. Yes. Yeah. Hi, can you... Oh, there we go. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Oh, awesome. Okay, so I just wanted to add in to the conversation as the animal control officer um, for Hingham, and I've been here 13 years, so I've known Tom for a very long time. Um, I have also done a lot of work helping Tom this last year, and I wouldn't have been on since 7 o'clock tonight if I didn't full fully feel that Tom would be an amazing handler. And... Um, I think that he would do an outstanding job because this last year when he reached out to me, he's gone above and beyond to ask every single question he could possibly think of. And he's genuinely showed how much he cares for the students that he's been helping um, all these years that he's been in the school. And on top of that, how he can make the kids feel comfortable with him being an officer and the dog. Not to mention that, you know, he had a chance that he could have left the school and been promoted to sergeant, but he made the decision that kids were important to him and their well being and has made this point to be willing to give this eight year commitment to do this. And I think that should be recognized because that's a huge commitment to take on. 
And another thing, I know Golden Opportunities didn't bring it up, but when you have a therapy dog, and this has been a question about handlers and no oh, multi-handlers and this and that, you have to think of the fact that this dog needs to bond with the person it's going to be with, be with just like we all have pets at home and how comfortable are they when you hand them off to your vet, especially now during COVID. And all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, they're going in, are they okay? You know, how is that dog gonna feel if it has a handler that's supposed to be training with and bonding with, and then it just gets hand off to someone else and for how long? Um, so that's why it's important to have that handler be its constant handler. And I've also taken the time to reach out as the representative from Golden Opportunity said, eight other towns have therapy dogs and those handlers are the SROs or a specific dedicated officer um, because I wanted to see if and what the schools did in those places. And they were all the SROs or officers. Um, some of them do have um, a backup and Tom and I have talked about that and I told him that I would in a second jump in and make sure that dog if something happened to Tom that I would take care of it until we could either he could get back to taking care of it and being the handler or we come up with an alternative and I plan on sticking by him through the next eight years um, with anything that he needs whether it's supplies whether it's you know getting the funding for if we need anything health wise we've already reached out to you a vet I'm working on figuring out a groomer. So we've put a lot of time and effort. We've even sat down to talk about the safest way to have the dog in his office. Whereas um, his office is very central located for anyone who's been in the school and has been by Tom's office. It's a perfect spot because any kid can walk by and stop and say, hey, how are you? And see this dog who's very well trained and be able to stop in and talk. And that opens the door. And if Tom, realizes this child needs more help, he can offer to take him down to one of the counselors and they can talk or have the counselor come down to his office. And yes, if need be, Tom can step out. The child doesn't want to talk with Tom in there and that's fine. But when it comes down to handlers, it's got to be um, a bond between both that dog and the handler. It cannot be bounced around to multiple people. So hopefully, I'm sorry, I know it's been a late night, but hopefully that kind of answers some things. Um, and like I said, I'm here for the long haul to help and be a backup to Tom with whatever he needs or questions people have that um, they need answered or anything like that. But I think it would be a real shame if Tom wasn't the handler, honestly. Okay, thank you. That's that's all really helpful. Uh, Jen? Um, thanks. Where'd it go? No, um, just wanna say that, you know, I've heard positive reports on Resox Comfort Dogs programs in other school districts and given that who the handler is doesn't fall under um, the purview of the school committee, then I am all for it. Okay, thank you, John. Carlos? Just a clarification because then I'm the one that kicked the, the conversation uh, and I wasn't essentially uh, opposing to Officer Ford being the handler, I was just asking if, it's po if it is possible for, to have a second handler. I think Officer uh, Badger just answered my question that it is possible, but you no, know, I do understand that uh, essentially it would be great to have mainly with one, uh, but you, you want to have plan B in place just in case. So I'm not opposed to Officer Ford being the handler. I just want to clarify that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Carlos. So uh, do we have consensus on the committee? Yeah, okay, yes. great. Okay, and then we can add this to the next policy agenda. So that's all. Thank fine. you very much. Hey, thanks everybody. Okay. It's exciting news, Rick. That's good yes, news. Yes, it is. <laughs> thank you for staying so late. So yes, thank you everybody. <laughs> I was gonna volunteer to be the other handler. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was going to. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, eight is subcommittee and project reports. Um, John? Uh, uh, <laughs> I'll be very quick. Uh, there's a building committee meet, a foster school building committee meeting on Wednesday. Uh, we're going to be doing some o planning for the OPM process and getting uh, comments, MSBA comments on that um, process. Um, uh, that's really all I have. Okay, thank you. Jen? All I have is I just have the uh, Foster School Council meeting coming up on March 3rd. Okay, Ness? I 
Yeah, you're muted. Sorry, <laughs> I couldn't get to my uh, unmute. Um, the only thing for the Finance Committee I wanted to report is the um, attachment that we were talking about that last meeting, the school enterprise and revolving funds, John and I went through that. So that um, has been finalized for the revolving accounts that we've covered to date. Um, and if you look over on the right hand side of the four columns or the five columns rather, there's a school committee rec recommended balance. Um, and that's just based on how John um, has, you know, what he needs to leave in those accounts um, for a reserve. So if you can take a look at that and let me know if you have any questions on that. Um, and then I just wanted to know, it, it kind of goes hand in hand with the equity work. Um, the Hingham Unity Council is going to be hosting a race talk on Thursday um, from 7 to 8.15. Uh, three Hingham residents are going to be discussing their experiences living in Hingham as persons of color. Um, and we are, this, there's several school committee members who will be in attendance. So um, it should be really enlightening. Thank you. Yeah. And it, we posted that meeting too. So um, the full committee can show up if, if they want to. Um, Carlos. I don't have anything. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Carlos. Libby. Um, just that the South Council is meeting on um, Wednesday, Wednesday morning. That's it. Thanks, Libby. Liza? Um, today, the Middle School School Council met, and we're going to be meeting uh, weekly as planning for a return to school. And then uh, we met for negotiations with the Administrators Association today and Unit A tomorrow. And I have master plan committee on Wednesday night. Thank you. And I don't have anything. Does anyone have anything for 48 hours? Okay, not seeing any. Um, this was a really long agenda. Thank you everyone who <laughs> set this out. I'll take a motion to adjourn to a executive session not to return to open session for the purposes of approving minutes of the executive session held on February 8th, 2021 and discussing strategy related to collective bargaining negotiations with HEA units A, C, and AA. Um, I'll uh, make that motion and add to it the public discussion of which may be detrimental to the committee's bargaining position. Thank you. I'll second. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Michelle? Aye. Jen? Aye. Chris? Aye. Aye. Carlos? Aye. Libby? Aye. Liza? Bye. I'm an I as well. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And we'll see everyone else in executive session in a few minutes.